Hello again, everybody, and welcome to an extra special third time is the charm edition of the Jim Cornette experience. It's been 25 years since my favorite show I ever promoted, the Night of Legends, and we're going to review the matches here today. And also, we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff, including things that piss me off. You see how cheerful I am today? And joining me here today to do this, here's Brian. Hello again, friends. Yeah, yeah, hello. That's not Are how you, you usually introduce meals not prepared for. I've done it twice that nobody heard. Well. I'm getting tired of chewing my food three times and not getting to swallow it. Do you think this one's going to make air, pal? I'm hopeful. We have the backup going right now. We have There's everything. a backup recording being made of this as we speak on cassette tape. Well, not on cassette tape because I'm not uh, the analog yet for this program, but we should probably explain to the listeners what exactly you're talking about. If they, I was no about idea. to once I chastised you. Chastised? And hopefully if you're feeling suitably chastened by your actions and activities over the past couple of days, we'll tell the people. This show is airing. Oh, God, we're in a time warp again. This show is airing the week of Thursday, August first right is that the first see i, that... I guess so oh yes. god damn we're, we're close to the first of august here at this point but we're recording it the previous week because this show was the show that we were going to broadcast last week and last week the special omnibus or on the bus edition that we sent out was supposed to be this week but because you didn't pay your electric bill well that's not true Okay, because New Jersey is a backwoods <laughs> state that can't keep electric service to its customers. Well, you may have something there. You may be on to something I, there. I thought you got a generator. We have a generator. But what happened was they did some electrical work down the road. Everything flickered, and the flicker shut the computer on and off. The generator would have come on if the electricity had stayed off a second longer. But it wasn't even a full second that it was off. It flickered. That caused the computer to crash. And yeah, that caused the conversation with you that was being recorded to crash twice, twice, but third times the twice, charm, as some may say, twice. One time after we had recorded thirty minutes of snappy comebacks, witty repartee, entertaining stories, knowledge, all lost because you do not have an audio cassette tape recorder in your home. What would have happened? What would have happened if the if you were recording it? God bless tape. If you were recording it back when we used to have audio tape and videotape and dependable things, what would have happened if the electricity had gone off? The recorder would have stopped right there. And when the electricity came back on seconds later, we would have continued on and nothing would have been wrong. See, I agree with you when it comes to music. Music really should be recorded analog. However, in this, let's use your example here. What if... There's a giant fire and all your tapes burn to the ground. Well, guess what, what if the guess what, what if my files in the cloud, baby? I'm oh, fine. For fucks. What if Michael Rennie and Klaatu were to land and give us 24 hours as an ultimatum? Fatu? Klaatu. It's one of the Samoan SWAT team. No, that was Fatu. Klaatu is Barada Nikto. <laughs> I don't know what you what? Klaatu Barada Nikto. You don't know how to save the world? I don't know what you're referencing. What the fuck? No. Okay, if Michael Rennie ever lands in a spaceship, and all the Cult of Cornet members that are with me on this out there can verify this, if Michael Rennie ever lands in a spaceship and gives the United Nations an ultimatum to cease their warlike ways or be destroyed, and you're incapacitated, and you got to give a message to somebody to save the world, what three words are you going to have them utter? Klaatu Barada Nikto! <laughs> What does that mean? <clears throat> it means don't fucking kill all these mu stupid motherfuckers. That's what it means. All right. Klaatu. Speaking of things that have changed, Klaatu, Barada, Nikto. <laughs> Speaking of, you're acting like you've never heard these words before. I've never, ever heard of this before. I don't know oh, what movie you're referencing or television Well, that, see, that's book, your first I'm not even going to tell you book. the movie now. I'm not even going to tell you the movie now because that's so insane that you would not have seen this movie and know what I'm talking about, that at, at everybody now is is beating on their, oh, whatever it is their monitors saying. and their phones and their things. And go, uh, McFly, 
No, no one's doing that. Barak Samu Fatu, whatever it is that you're saying. Yeah. What does it Af- say one more time? Afasika. Af- 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 what is it's, it? It's Klatu Barada Nikto. I'm going to look it up while you. All right. Anyway, something else that. people have fucked up. Not only do we not have audio tape anymore so we can save these fine programs, but they fucked Twitter up last week or this week. It's last week now as you're listening to this. You see why I'm going with this. They, they changed the whole goddamn thing. I turned it on one day, and there is goddamn everything that was on the right side is on the left side. Everything left side is the right side. The font has changed. The colors have changed. The layout's changed. I can, it gives me a headache trying to look at it. I can't figure this shit out. <laughs> so I just fucking turned I, I tweeted to have if they fuck this up, what the fuck's going on. And then I turned it off because it was giving me a headache. I told everybody just cuss themselves out. And then uh, uh, several of the cult of cornet members sent me a, you, a, a thing. Hold on here. It's on here somewhere. I can bring this up. It's yeah. as if the earth stood still. Yeah. See now you go to the Chrome web store. They gave me a link. To, and it goes to the Chrome Web Store, and you add something, and and then it then your Twitter looks the same as it used to. But you have to. I'm not doing it right somehow because you have to do it every time you get on Twitter, which is an echo. I got to find the email, then find the link, then click the thing. So and it, it, it's it's a pain in the ass. So if anybody knows how to make this thing stick, I may have to get a professional on this, call in somebody to spend some money, but it's fucking ridiculous. I know. And everybody's like, Oh, change is good. Change it. No change is the shits. I used to have to fucking <laughs> constantly hear that. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Just the way you said changes the shits. Changes the shits. Not always. Vince McMahon was all about oh, change is good. And then Bruce, of course, because anything Vince said, you know, little sir echo would comment 12 <laughs> seconds later. <laughs> change is good. No, change sucks. If if you got a dirty diaper, that change is good. Change to the clean diaper. The the cars change, but they didn't from the Model T to today, but they didn't suddenly in 1947 said, hey, let's put the fucking steering wheel in the back seat and then make everybody drive backwards and back up. Or they didn't make the goddamn wheels go sideways instead of forward and back or whatever the fuck don't change shit that works just to change it it's fucking stupid then everybody that knows how to do something you got to spend that time to fucking learn that all over again and somebody kept saying well and then turn your browser off what the fuck does that mean i can either click on one of these little fucking icon things on the monitor or i can push the button and turn the fucking computer off or I can unplug the whole thing, which is what I ought to be doing right before I throw it off the fucking deck. So they fucked up Twitter. Anyway, <laughs> here's something that's good. You want some good news? I'll give you motherfuckers some good news. See, now you got me pissed off already. Me. We were so happy the first 30 minutes of program number one, and then the first seven minutes of program number two, I was so happy. Uh, behind the curtain. Real Pro Wrestling Stories by Jim Cornette and Brandon Easton and published by IDW Publishing. The uh, Kickstarter copies have been mailed to the Kickstarter folks. Many of them already have them in their greasy little hands. They're tweeting them. It's, it's fucking insane. It's, it's behind the curtain mania is taking over the, the world. And if you are a Kickstarter and you haven't already got it, you're going to be getting it soon. Well, what the fuck am I saying? You're not going to hear this till next week. You've already got it. <clears throat> and we're and I'm going to be contacting a few of you for some extra special stuff now that we've got this book uh, in your firm little hands. And keep watching JimCornette.com, ladies and gentlemen, because not only is Behind the Curtain real pro wrestling stories going to be available at bookstores everywhere and on Amazon and Barnes & Noble and Gilbert and & Sullivan and all the other bookstores, but also I'm going to have a special limited edition collector's edition signed and numbered series that's only going to be available at jimcornet.com this thing is literally it's going to be on more street corners than fucking than the tampon girl it's going to be everywhere it's going to cover the world so keep looking out for that 
That's going to happen in the next couple of weeks. Um, hey, Jim, you have yes. commented on it and started out as a comic book. I'm curious, what are your thoughts about the news that Mad Magazine is shutting down? Well, and it, I, that's another piece of bad news I was about to get to in a second. Not only is Mad Magazine shutting down, but Fighting Spirit Magazine is shutting down. The last issue will be the next one. And it, it, that uh, they fucked up Rolling Stone last year and made it a monthly and a, a, like an art magazine, and it just it doesn't have the same appeal. Um, it, it, we're entering an era where magazines in general and print in general, look at newspapers. They're half the size they used to be, half the thickness, half the page size, because <laughs> I guess uh, we might as well just go ahead and say it. This is why so many people of the younger generation are blithering fucking simpletons because nobody reads anymore. They don't learn anything because they don't read anything. I've been reading since I was two and a half, actually, I believe is they, my parents say, is when they learned me, learned me my first bit of reading, writing, and arithmetic. Uh, but that's been my favorite thing throughout life, is to read. That's why I have such a massive collection of books on su such a variety of subjects, and I've always been a collector. Nobody reads anymore. Nobody learns anything. Nobody gets the bottom of anything. They, just, they read their fucking uh, drunk uncle's Facebook, but they don't read books or magazines or newspapers. And it's, it's a shame because... You know, people keep asking me, are you going to do this book or that book as a Kindle or an e-book or whatever? That is, there is no such thing as an e-book. If it's not on paper, it ain't a fucking book. And I only do things that last, that last the test of time, that not only impart knowledge, but last as a physical entity that you can hold in your hand and put your bookmark in and study from and learn Buy two copies so you can underline some stuff in one of them and not mess it up for the not mess the other one up. You had to make me mad again, didn't you? That got you more fired up than I thought it was going to. <laughs> well, books, books, reading. Do you know my favorite episode of the Twilight Zone ever? Time enough at last. I could identify with Burgess Meredith. I was I cried the first time I saw that. I was like nine years old when he broke his glasses. I thought that could happen to me. Finally, I'd be alone in the world, the last human being left, nobody to get in my way, say stupid shit to me, bother me, whatever the fuck, and I'd find the library and I'd have 19, at the time this was 1969, 1969, 1970, 1971, 1972, all laid out, ready to read, and I'd break my glasses. Anyway. Is this uh, something you thought about as a kid, the idea of? I wish everyone was gone and I, I could have everything to myself. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't everybody? <laughs> what? Anyway, uh, I do want to thank uh, one person, Neil. I can't pronounce your last name, but your little Palm Logan for Harley's birthday package. A nice pack, like a dozen stuffed toys. She's got this one little stuffed watermelon that's only about as big as your fist that she can get her, her little mouth around. She loves playing fetch with that. Uh, but thank you, Neil, and thank Logan, too. We'll have to schedule a play date. And uh, thank all the, um, what is it, about 3.2 million of you. Record month in July on the Jim Cornette Experience, the drive through YouTube. Record month on everything, pretty much. Again. What we're saying here. Again. <laughs> I don't mean to beat this to death and belabor it, but it happens every month. So thank you to the 3.2 million of you who listen to me on YouTube just on one of the channels for 15 million minutes, I think, last month, and et cetera. Um, important word on the mega, mega smash hit ratings bonanza. Tremendous miniseries that's been turned into a full-fledged program. Dark Side of the Ring on Viceland has been renewed for season two. Last year, there were six episodes. This year, there are going to be 10. It's going to be fantastic. And to answer everyone's question, put your fears at rest. Jim Cornette, his knowledge, his wisdom, his historical accuracy, and also many fine things from the vault are going to be featured heavily on this season two as well. So fear not for those of you that were afeard. Hello? Are you still there? <laughs> I was wondering if you were still afeard. Um, 
Anyway, okay, now this comes the hard part. See, I'm running through this stuff so we can get to Night of Legends as quickly as possible, but I'm trying to keep everybody updated. I had all the notes for what our schedule was, and then your electrical issues threw us off. So this week is... Only it was on paper. Well, we'd still have it right there. No, I have the notes on paper, but I had the notes written on what we were going to do based on doing this show last week and then that show this week. So basically, do we have <laughs> do we have a show coming? <laughs> we got a we got a show next week. The Jim Cornette experience will be back as normal next week. And we'll have something for the drive through because we have yes, we have a special on the bus edition for the drive through We do. There's a special on the bus edition for the Monday before this episode comes out, but after we're recording. So they already know it that then. So Well, that's my question for you. Are you saying there's another omnibus coming? No, the, the bus has already left. Because the bus air Where's the bus, the bus? Left Monday. The bus left Monday because <laughs> this is behind. Here, but folks, here's the, the issue. It's a magic bus. Yes. Yeah, magic bus. Um, I, 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 everybody's got to do it sometime and we have really been good with keeping the experience up and occasionally I miss a drive through, but I guess last week now, something I haven't done yet. The, no, this week I'm doing it as we speak. Um, I, I had to take a week off to, uh, Stacey and I are going to deal with some of the issues related with her father's estate probate and et cetera, and, and getting some things taken care of and, and, I'm going to be either on the road or in meetings or dealing with stuff down there. So we had to take a week off, which is why we're doing all this screwy scheduling. So I hope that everybody will um, bear with us when we don't know what we're doing. Actually, I always know what I'm doing. I just don't know when I'm doing it. Um, but uh, if you've ordered from Cornette's Collectibles at jimcornette.com by Thursday, July 25th, your stuff was sent out Friday morning, the 26th. And if you've ordered in the last week, it will be going out this coming Monday morning, August 5th. So everybody's taken care of there. And I do want to uh, thank Stephen P. New for the referral. You know, Stephen, in addition to being the consigliere of the cult of Cornette and a legal beagle of epic proportions, a genius of the level of Clarence Darrow, Johnny Cochran, who was that other fucking guy that gave us all those fucking stupid twats on reality TV? Kardashian. He was a good lawyer, wasn't he? Well, he was all right, but he was he was kind well, of a local guy. It was F. Lee Bailey, Robert F. Shapiro. Bailey. That's F. Lee Bailey. Hold on, no, but even on Star Trek. Yeah, but F. Lee Bailey got this barred. Let's not use him as the example here, but well, that, that only, caliber of attorney. The great barristers and attorneys all the way down through history. Nobody stacks up. To our friend and yours, Stephen P. New, because not only is he a legal genius like that, but he has tentacles, he has reach, he has contacts that spread across the country and the world. If you have are in need of legal services, if Stephen P. New can't do it for you, and like I said, if Stephen can't get your ass paid and your ass don't accept cash, but if he can't do it for you, he can lay his his tentacles on somebody who can, a legal expert in every corner of the country and every specialty. So we encourage the cult of Cornette members to take advantage. Don't take advantage of him. We wouldn't want you to do that, but take advantage of the opportunity that you have with Stephen P. New in your midst. Newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. If you need to sue, call Stephen P. New. But if you just need help, call Stephen instead of Yelp. I may have to work on that when I get back with you. Boy, that was bad. Well, you edit it out then, motherfucker. I don't know what to say. <laughs> I'm try, I've, I've done this part of this show this fucking three times now. Um, uh, also, a couple more quick updates. My last remaining scheduled personal appearance in public that is confirmed for the year 2019 will be in just a couple of weeks or even less by now. Uh, at the gathering in Charlotte, North Carolina, August 15th through the 18th, tmartpromotions.com for all the information. But it's the, the Charlotte fan fest that we know and love is coming back. And listen, he's got Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Every member of the Midnight Express, including Bobby Eaton, Stan Lane, Dennis Condry, myself, and Ravishing Randy Rose, Bob Backlund, Sergeant Slaughter, Ron Simmons, Lex Luger, Larry Zbysko, Kevin Sullivan, Magnum TA, Superstar Bill Dundee. I don't think he's been to Charlotte ever. 
Um, they got a barbecue pool party. They've got the dealers. There they are calling me right now to give me an update. Who the fuck might this be? Who are the dealers? Um, apparently they're drug dealers. I don't know. It, it says AT and T. Hold on. <laughs> fuck off. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Well, I don't have any, I don't know anybody that works for AT&T, so I'm busy. I'm working here. I'm working here. Uh, anyway, they've got all kinds of stuff. The dealer's tables in the dealer's room where all the collectibles are, are bought and sold and traded and, and takes place. And the Friday night banquet, all that and more in Charlotte. TMartPromotions.com, August 15th through the 18th, The Gathering. And uh, Is it going to be also- a little awkward? Being there at a table and it's you and it's Dennis and Bobby and Stan and you have all your merchandise with pictures of you and Dennis and Bobby and Stan and books with Dennis and Bobby and Stan and then there's Randy Rose. <laughs> like, now, now, why do you got Why you got to be that way? No, but seriously, I'm asking. Randy you. never did anything to anybody. Randy worked just as hard as everybody else and doesn't deserve that kind of treatment. That's kind of what I'm saying. Yes, I agree. And I mean, hopefully it won't be awkward. We'll put Randy at the kids' table where he can't see up that far to see what we're selling. Anyway, um, and also as as far as other appearances, folks, the mirror has cracked. I've got too much going on, and it's starting to get into the holiday season by October at jimcornette.com, so I'm probably not going to be doing any other appearances except I'm still, and we've been chasing each other, working with MLW to nail down any dates with them through early 2020 as soon as possible. And those are going to be my only other public appearances. And, and we're trying, but some of these dates are too far away, but we're working on it. I can be bribed, but I don't know if there's that much money in the treasury, but some of the dates are far away. And as we know, I've retired from New York city. So we're working on that now as we speak anyway. I think now this is generally the part of the program where the fucking Skype call goes dead and you tell me that we have to start over again. Can we continue? What's that? Say that again. Are you there? What are you you doing this week on the 605? He'll hear this, folks. What are you doing on the (laughs) 605 and related programs this week? Jim, it's so good to hear your voice once again. Coming through (laughs) clearly here on the line. Uh, I don't know what we're doing because I don't know where we are. Uh, I guess a few things I'll plug. John Arezzi's Pro Wrestling Spotlight, then and now. We have just done a series of episodes looking at the early summer of 1989, obviously week by week. And I can tell you on the June 11th episode, 1989, Paulie Dangerously says some really slanderous and awful things about Jim and the Midnight Express. And the next week, they take a bus trip to New Haven, John and his listeners, and Jim Cornette finally will be on Pro Wrestling Spotlight, his very first appearance. Check that out, as well as so much more, and you can hear the full episodes by becoming a patron of John Arezzi's Pro Wrestling Spotlight at patreon.com slash Arezzi, but you can hear the show at pwspod.com or available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcast. Also, let me remind everyone about the Mid-South Wrestling Television Review with myself and Mike Mills at midsouthpod.com, and also want to make mention of Breaking Kayfabe with Baldrin and Barry. They've been joined a lot lately by... Barry Horowitz, who wants to be known as now as Mr. Technical. I don't know if this nickname will stick, but we'll find out. Baldrinpod.com are available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcast. You can get news about all Arcadian Vanguard podcasts on Twitter, at Super Podcast. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! <laughs> Boo on me! No one ever said that except Larry Zabisco in that song. Boo on me! That's what I say. It 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 doesn't that doesn't make sense grammatically, does it? Why did they name the song "Boo on Me"? <laughs> I I wasn't there. It wasn't my week to watch them. I don't know. But oh, uh, but the drugs back then were spectacular, and you'll find out more about drugs and wrestling on the Six Hundred Five Super Podcast. I assume you'll need drugs to listen to the Six Hundred Fives. You'll need lots of drugs. But episode 100 will be coming at you based on when this is coming out. I guess we're about a week away or so. But more news on social media and everywhere else that you follow me and see me. But the 605 Super Podcast, go through the archives at 605pod.com. And of course, it's available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcasts. The Mothership. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. The premise of today's program, now that we've gotten all that out of the way and everybody knows where we stand. Um. 
And, you know, I was going to say one more thing also, just earlier, talking about the Twitter thing. Have Also, when did professional wrestlers and people in the wrestling business become a bunch of gutless fucking sniveling pussies? When did that happen? I would say around the turn of the century. But it's, it's, boy, the turn of the century, everybody fucking turned to fucking jelly. Because every, I now have... The, 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 the cosplay wrestlers have their own little play group, kind of like the fucking, you know, kindergartners when the, uh, the high schoolers are over there doing high schooler stuff, the kindergartners are playing out in their own little group, but they get the fucking hurtest feelings that I've ever seen, especially when I call attention to the fact that one of their number is a fucking idiot or a piece of shit, or in some way, a waste of human flesh. But I'm just thinking I want to think back to, say, 1983 in Louisiana. If somebody attacked, physically attacked Butch Reed, Butch Reed wouldn't get his feelings hurt about it down in New Orleans. He'd just let the New Orleans Police Department drag the guy into the room that we all have heard about that was right next to the back door and throw him in the room. And then Butch would go back and speak with that fan for a couple of minutes while the police stood outside. And then the police would go in when Butch left and take what was left and chuck it out back in the alley. Nobody got their feelings hurt. I don't understand when suddenly all of a sudden everybody's, Oh, I mean, they want to be inclusive. They want to make sure everybody didn't get their feelings hurt. Nobody, no, no fan that yelled anything at me ever hurt my feelings unless it was followed by a fist or he had a knife in his hand. I wanted them to say horrible things about me. But you know the difference between, oh, I think all these butthurt fucking cosplay wrestlers and back then is that they know I'm telling the truth. They know that they're a bunch of fucking... Circus sideshow fucking geeks, JoJo the dog face boy, and Zippy the pinhead. Now I'll hear from the pinhead lobby. And they realize that they're just fucking circus freaks with no substance and no talent. And they just wiggle their way across the fucking ring like slugs, like snails, leaving a trail of slime and do their comedy spots and then leave it to the talented folks in wrestling to try to come in and wipe up the mat from the slime and, and actually entertain people in a proper fashion, but they get their feelings hurt a lot. And all I hear from all elite is we want to be all inclusive. We want everybody to feel good. Uh, get somebody over, draw some fucking serious money on a regular basis. And to do that, you're going to have to hurt some people's fucking feelings. Not only the fans, but also the wrestlers that you say, Hey, well, I know we signed you, but we were fucking delusional. And now that we realize what the fuck we've done, we're going to have to fucking move you on out so we can actually sign some fucking talent. They're going to have to hurt some wrestlers feelings. But anyway, did you see they announced a match for all out a three way match? Darby Allen versus Jelly Janela versus Jimmy Havoc. Well, I think that's there. That's probably Cody because he learned from Dusty because remember when Jimmy Valiant was so over in the Carolinas, he was so mega over, but he, he, by then the matches were gone, right? He was limited. So what Dusty did was he booked him against Paul Jones because Paul Jones at the time, honestly, was not that good of a manager. I think we can all agree on that. He was a great wrestler in his day, but he wasn't that good a manager. And, but he was figured in because he was, had been loyal to the Crockett's for so long. So Anybody that Dusty would put in Paul Jones's stable generally would be the guys that had to fucking put Boogie over and feud with Jimmy in the ring so he'd keep it all contained. That was the rotten match on the show that did sell tickets. But even then, it looked like fucking Luthez versus Carl Gotch compared to what they try to do today. But I think that's Cody's thing. Just get all the fucking garbage in one place where we can get it in and get it out without too much of it smelling too bad. That may be that principle. What do you think of the news of uh, AEW getting Wednesday nights on TNT? I knew that already, just to be quite honest. But anyway, uh, so today's program, it is the 25th anniversary of the Night of Legends, the my most favorite show that I ever promoted uh, between OVW and, and Smoky Mountain Wrestling, basically anywhere that I had full control of what was going on. This is my favorite show. 
And I realized, because I thought since it was an anniversary, we've done a deep dive on the business aspect and the gate and how we try to draw the money and market the show and sell the tickets, but we've never actually sat down and talked about the matches and the show itself, the Legends celebration, the whole nine yards from start to finish. Because I had not, and I didn't even realize this, but now I realize it, since I was responsible for post-production of the videotape, I haven't watched the whole thing from start to finish in order, ever. So that's been 24 and a half years. So it was, <laughs> I mean, it's some of the Thrill Seekers and Heavenly Bodies I've seen 27 times. I mean, that's been everywhere. But I haven't seen the whole thing start to finish. So I thought we would go over that in the manner in which we have been to reviewing the shows that, you know, the, the modern shows, the current shows, because everybody then will see that I'm not just going to praise everything depending on what, or damn anything, depending on what time period it took place in. Um, there is, there is one wrinkle. I realized that this is not a show. If you're not a long time fan and you didn't buy the, the VHS tape, this is not a show that everybody can watch all at the same time. Cause it's not available on the network. It's not, out there on YouTube, I don't believe. Uh, so, with, at the risk of starting a panic, the warehouse DVD find, the Wrestling Gold DVDs, the Before They Were Famous, the uh, Wrestling's Future Stars, it also contains, and I still have a little under 200 copies left, of the Night of Legends DVD, the four-hour DVD, the whole show, all the celebrations, all the videotape, everything, for nine bucks. <laughs> I'm not trying to create a panic. I know sometimes I break the internet when I do this, but if you want to go back and listen to this program after having purchased Night of Legends at jimcornett.com, just click on collectibles and go to the DVD section. When these are gone, they're gone because this was the warehouse find. So if you want to do that thing, be one of the first 200 people to do it or you're going to be shit out of luck. Nine bucks. How can I do this? Anyway, did I? Yes, I've already enlightened you also on one of our previous attempts at this, that I looked at my top five shows, actually top six, because two of them kind of pretty much tied at the gate. But the, the six biggest shows that I ever promoted, as I said, when I had complete control of everything so I knew what the fuck was going to go on and, and how to, to go about it, in OVW and Smoky Mountain together, <clears throat> from start to finish, from one to six. O number one, OVW Christmas Chaos 2000. Number two, OVW Last Dance 2001. Number three, Smoky Mountain Wrestling Super Bowl 1995. Number four, Smoky Mountain Wrestling Night of Legends 1994. And five and six, the OVW Rock and Rumble 2000 and Smoky Mountain Wrestling Sunday Bloody Sunday of 94. That was in February. Did a combined total of around 24,000 fans and 270 grand at the gate, which would work out to somewhere north of $420,000 in today's money. And three of those shows took place in a wrestling recep recession, the same time period as the WWE lost $6 million in a calendar year. So that wasn't bad for some independent shows. I kind of like, and, and I know some smart ass out there is going to say, I'll, I'll in do 10,000 people in 16 seconds and sold 72,000 people and it blah, 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 did this. I'm talking about actually running these towns and drawing these amount of people from the towns these shows were run in. I'm not talking about the internet causing mass hysteria, causing everyone to fly in from all around the world. <clears throat> sort of like when they said, oh, WrestleMania in New Orleans, right? Did 75,000 people at Superdome and 1,500 of them were actually from New Orleans. JYD used to do 25,000 people four times a year and they were all from Louisiana. Have we, that's another thing we've lost sight of, isn't it? Is that these, these mega crowds that supposedly these guys are drawing and, and any of, actually they're the only ones even drawing mega crowds. Vince didn't even draw mega crowds anymore before the internet and before, as I said, this mass hysteria, you actually used to have to make an impression in a specific market. People used to have to know who you were on the streets of that town. You had to advertise and get people from there and from a hundred mile radius 
to go to your shows or elsewise they were not going to draw. So considering the good old days, that ain't bad. Show me anybody else that's draw that's running six shows and drawing almost half a million dollars these days, besides the cosplay wrestlers. And should we even should we should we start giving them records in another business? Okay, the cosplay wrestling record is this. Yeah, maybe, maybe. <clears throat> so anyway, there you have it, folks. The uh, the 25th anniversary of Night of Legends, the wrap up of my six top shows. But Night of Legends was my favorite because it was a love letter to East Tennessee wrestling. I didn't grow up on it. I got to be close to it. I knew a lot of the people. I got to see it sometimes when I went to my Uncle Harold's house. But at the same time, it was one of the great, and as everybody who listens to Brian's show with Ron Fuller, the stud cast, will will realize it was one of the great small territories in the business at the time. And so I wanted to pay tribute to that, and at the same time, make a statement with the, the fact that Smoky Mountain Wrestling was the 90s version of southeastern wrestling in the 70s or continental wrestling in the 80s that we owned the town that we were the premier promotion in knoxville and it worked uh since not only did the knoxville uh history segments really add to the television show i've mentioned that we built up to where our local rating on the fox station the week before night of legends was an eight not even the share but the rating uh people still remembered and they still wanted to to know about those guys and to see the footage. And at the same time, that was the all time record crowd that we had drawn in Knoxville or anywhere else up to that point, because they were, they were interested in the matches and the, the talent and et cetera, that was going to actually be performing as well as the legends that were just going to be, you know, guest starring. So anyway, <clears throat> should we, and should we tell them also that there's an Easter egg in this, the great Brian last is in a a crowd shot on the Night of Legends DVD available at jimcornet.com. But we're not going to tell you where, because that way it's it's the fun thing. You, they got to pick you out, right? Okay. <laughs> it's just your idea. I guess so. But yes, I am in a crowd shot. Well, because shot. you're so mysterious. You're like fucking Howard Hughes. If, the, if I dangle that people <laughs> will see you somewhere, then probably sell a bunch of these things. Anyway, going from the start, and you remember the show, so you can help me along with this, but we opened up my announced team. Well, we, we did a cold open. I, and I went with the height camera around Knoxville. I shot Nayland stadium, which of course where the UT university of Tennessee volunteers play football on game day in Knoxville, Tennessee, Nayland stadium is the sixth largest city in the state of Tennessee, a hundred thousand fucking people every game. And it's been that way for years. So we shot Nayland stadium. We shot the, Tennessee River and the bridges. We got the the shot from up on the hill of the Civic Coliseum, and Jim Ross did my voiceover that I wrote. Um, and then Jim Ross and Les Thatcher were the announce team. And the opening shot to me still gave me goosebumps because it looked say we did it at intermission because the crowd was so big it, they weren't in their seats before the show actually started. So we did the open at, for the TV and the videotape at intermission. But to see the full house drawn all the way back, panned down with the lights up, you can see everybody. It was a big time feel and a nice arena. And Jim Ross and Les Thatcher were the perfect announce team, not only to call wrestling as a sport, but Les had so much history in Knoxville. He had been the announcer for Southeastern. <clears throat> you know, he knew all the guys. So he was the great color guy, the perfect color guy. And Jim Ross, obviously, was the voice of wrestling. Yeah, and those, those packages you did to build up the show, in a lot of ways, they felt like a love letter from Les Thatcher to East Tennessee. Because, I mean, he was there even before Southeastern. He was tag team partners of Whitey. That's right. Yeah. And, and you know, and Whitey was one of his good friends. And that's, I was made note of this, but I'll say it now. When, during the, the history segment on Whitey Caldwell, when Les got to the fucking story, and we did that at the Tennessee Production Center studio, he's sitting down in the studio. But when he got to the, because I had written these things out, you know, as bullet points for him. And when he got to the last part of it and he tried to say, Whitey Caldwell was such an icon in East Tennessee that the fans still go to the cemetery in Kingsport where he's buried and put flowers on his grave. And at the time, that was 22 years after his death. 
And I even get choked up about it because that was true. And he, he, his voice cracked, you know, Les Thatcher with that voice of God and his voice cracked because Whitey was his tag team partner and a good friend of his. But that was the kind of thing. That's what I wanted to, to show the modern fan in 1994 at that time, how popular, how over, how respected, how loved these guys were. And that continued. I think Bo James still may do it. I don't know. But that was that continued well into the 90s, that that fans from the old days, Whitey was killed in 1972. They would still go and put flowers and cards on his grave. He meant that much to them and, and to their parents and grandparents. Anyway, <laughs> our first match. Do you remember the first match on the Night of Legends? Okay, let me guess for a second, because the first match... I remember Richard Slinger was on the show, but I'm trying to remember <laughs> if that was the first match. And we were surprised he was there, but then we remembered he was Terry Gordy's nephew. So it meant yes. he was a local guy. Was it Richard Slinger? Well, it, 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 technically, yes, but actually, no, because that was a dark match. We didn't put that on the DVD. But the first match at Night of Legends was Richard Slinger against, and who was working Japan at the time? And he was Terry's nephew. And he came up with Terry, which we'll get to. Against Conan Chris Walker. That's right. That's yeah. right. I, you know what? I remembered that we saw Chris Walker and I saw that he wasn't on the DVD listing. And I was like, wait a minute. I know that this is like the only show he worked before he walked out the next night. But- well, he saved me some trouble because as I go back and look at the run in he did later on that night in Terry's match with uh, fucking Dirty White Boy, I probably would have fired him by TV that Monday. <laughs> um oh my god greener than a fucking pepper tree uh he had i was been trying... working for a while he'd been working for at least three years by that point he was yeah. in the wwf he'd been global i was I, I was looking for a heel he lived in georgia so he was close enough to drive i was somewhat desperate because that's when jake had left more on that later um and i was trying to find a fu- and he looked like a million dollars and i got bamboozled by the body but god and he made this, and I'm trying to, did he come to Johnson City the next night, or did he no-show there, and and I just said, fuck it. I think he was, I don't even think he came to Johnson City. He might not have, but somewhere in a, he, he was in, supposedly agreed to come in. I had him booked for a couple weeks around the horn, and I never saw him again. And to, as a matter of fact, I just got a phone call from a lady in the WWE office who calls me sometimes as a resource when they can't find a motherfucker that they owe $14 in royalties from, from 20 years ago. And that was the first name she mentioned, Conan Chris Walker. I was, I couldn't find him when he worked for me. So, <laughs> but anyway, the first match on the actual DVD, Doug Furness versus Killer Kyle. And, and now if you buy the DVD at jimcornett.com or if they ever put up any of this on the, network from the tv show etc the entrances are edited because this was a commercial release right so the entrances are edited because of music it's the only time if you got the actual vhs's when we sold them 25 years ago you'll get the real entrances but it it pisses me off so bad because the music was such a big deal and such a big part of a lot of the guys and especially doug furnace was obvious he was living in san diego at the time because he was working japan exclusively but doug was a football star at the university of tennessee and that's where they broke him into wrestling was in continental in the late 80s and that's why he was coming back we had made the deal that uh, this is right around the time period we were trying to train his brother mike to get into wrestling and then mike had a car wreck and blah 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 mike was not a natural anyway but doug was coming back and forth uh, to help in that. And I said, I got to have you on a night of legends. So he had, he was in town. So, but anyway, Doug comes out to Rocky top by the Osborne brothers, Rocky top. You'll always be home, sweet home to me. Good old Rocky top, Rocky top, Tennessee. And everybody in the place that I should mention now, folks, I didn't just become a country music fan, although this is bluegrass. Rocky Top by the Osborne Brothers is bluegrass, which is not country. Bluegrass is authentic. However, that's a fight song. The University of Tennessee Volunteers. Do you remember everybody in the fucking building singing that at the top of their lungs while he runs out with the goddamn UT football shirt and people just go crazy, right? Well, I remember people cheer. I don't remember the singing, I have to be honest. <laughs> well, they always sung yeah. it. <laughs> anyway, but they went crazy for Rocky Top. And it was 
Killer Kyle was just about to transition into, he, I was managing him at the time, but then he was going to transition into being one of the gangsters posse. Um, so he was, he was in between programs, whatever, but Kyle was always a good guy to put on the card because he was almost 300 pounds, but he moved quick. He took big bumps. He could work. Having said that, he fucked up this finish and I'll tell you why they, they had the strong man match. Um, at one point, Doug worked the most painful looking fucking headlock I've ever seen for real. He was grinding. Kyle was like, hey, it looked like he was going, please loosen up, please loosen up. Um, <clears throat> but then Kyle got a receipt. He cut him off with a Eddie Gilbert hot shot that bent Doug backwards in half like a pocket knife. And he did some good stuff. But then when Doug started firing up, Kyle should have been more aggressive. He lost the intensity. Um, he he was, you know, hitting the ropes to clothesline him and Doug was firing up, but he was just, he didn't have it in his face. But Doug's comeback as a, versus a 300 pound man, he grabbed Kyle and with no assistance, gave him the belly to belly overhead fucking throw halfway across the ring, then shot him off, did a backflip drop kick, then shot him off and did a tight fucking turnaround power slam. Doug Furness, I'd forgotten, and a lot of people who only saw him in that fucking rotten WWF run, they don't realize what an athlete he was. Those 32-inch thighs, he really was, at one point, the world's strongest man. His records in what? The three-lift, the uh, deadlift, whatever the fucking deadlift, clean and jerk, whatever the three lifts are. If we had Mark Henry here, he could tell me. He set a fucking record. He was, uh, you know, he was just an incredible athlete. And then he goes for the finish. He goes for the Frankensteiner before I, I, who was doing it first? Was it Scott or was it Furnace? Well, Scott was doing it in late 89. So that was, I don't know when Furnace started doing it, but Scott was doing it well, in late 89. But Doug Furnace's Frankensteiner was every bit as good as Scott's, and it was even more impressive because of those fucking thighs, right? The biggest, most guys waste. But when he jumped up to do it, Kyle bumfuzzled. Instead of feeding Doug his head, he put his arms out to his sides like he was going to scoop Doug's legs when he got him over his shoulders. But what he did was he caught fucking Doug's legs on the way up. But Doug, in midstream, it was like he jumped up and just body scissored Kyle around the waist, bent backwards, took him over anyway, and ended up sitting on top of him, pinned him one, two, three. And then you could see he's fucking tearing his tape off, and he's like, fuck. And he got out of the ring quick. But it was the opening match, and it got Doug Furness uh, a win in Knoxville and just people to see him in person. That's all I cared about, but it could have been better. But we bump things up significantly with what's next and I had everybody do interviews beforehand also, just your match tonight. You're at the Night of Legends, and tonight you're facing so-and-so, right? And f everybody on the card did them in probably 45 minutes tops because that's all you had to do back then, even with the green guys, even with the Candidos of the world, and, and you know, almost everybody except the Thrill Seekers. We'll get to that in a minute. Um Tell them, here's your match. You're at the Night of Legends. Give me a minute promo. And they could do it because that's what guys did back then. And they weren't waiting for, well, what should I say? What, what, what would my character say? Fuck. <clears throat> and the best two, honestly, were next Dick Slater and Bob Orton Jr. And Ronnie Garvin and the Mongolian Stomper, although Stomper did not speak. But off the top of their heads, they did classic 70s fucking wrestling promos. And especially Orton was fucking, and Slater was hilarious. Um, and then that was the legends tag match, Bob Orton Jr. And Dick Slater, who were at one time, one of the premier tag teams in the world against Ronnie Garvin and the Mongolian stomper who were at one time main event, babyface and heel respectively in Knoxville fighting over the Southeastern title. And this was like a dream tag team. Cause I don't know that they'd ever teamed up with Mac McMurray as the referee. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> And once again, I was I was sad we couldn't use the entrances and the entrance music here because Dick Slater came out to Renegade by Styx. You know, and once again, everybody goes, oh, goddamn, Cornette's music choice. It's 1994. A lot of this stuff's going to be real old, but it wasn't that old then. But also, this was the Legends match. Um, 
I can't remember. I didn't look at my copy of the tape. It still has the entrances on it. I can't remember what we used for Bob Orton Jr. Can you? I thought he came out with Slater. I don't remember him having I, a separate I entrance. Think, I, th- I think everybody had individual, because Garvin and Stomper had individual ones. Because I know for, because Stomper came out to Halloween. That's where I was going with this thing anyway. <clears throat> By that point, Archie was mostly retired. He would work a few independents. He'd work a few shots for me. But he was working for the Knox County Sheriff's Department. He transported prisoners. And a lot of times they would realize that they were being transported by the Mongolian stomper. And you'd never seen a nicer bunch of convicted felons in your life. They didn't want to fuck with him. But the way I presented stomper was the way that people remembered him. He had in the past sold for people. And he had in the past bled. And he had in the past even been beaten, although at one point in the 70s, he had so much heat with the people that on the, like Eastern Kentucky spot shows, they'd put, they'd send the baby face out first. Then they'd send Stomper out and have the baby face jump him when he went through the ropes and the baby face would beat Stomper up for five minutes or so. And then Stomper would walk out and get counted out because if he took over, they'd have people coming in the ring. But I always wanted to be high intensity to some extent. Of course, they had to have a tag match here, but we always we played the Halloween music, ding, 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 dun, dun. and then here would come fucking Stomper rushing to the ring, and he'd hit the ring, and they'd break into chaos, and that's what they did here. They did, they started out, they had wild and crazy, but safe shit. Everybody looked like men. They were fighting and brawling around, and then they went back in the ring, and then they settled it down. And Garvin worked most of the match, especially they got the heat on Garvin's because Stomper was had to get the tag. You couldn't have the Mongolian Stomper selling. But this was this was the best match of the night, in my opinion. And I'm going to tell you why as we go through everything. And the only thing that fucked it up was the finish, which it was not the finish it was supposed to be. It was a classic 70s Southern wrestling style tag match done by masters of that craft. Like I said, it was crazy and wild, but everything was safe. Everybody looked like men. The psychology was there. Everybody's work was perfect. Nobody was ever lost. Bob Orton Jr. was the star of the show. He was mostly retired at that point, and his shit still looked better than everybody's. And it was different. He had a different way of working. Garvin was not far behind in this one. Uh, you know, everybody talks about what <laughs> what a talent. Everybody knows what they're talking about. Talks about what a talent Randy Orton is. And one time Heyman said, who would you, who would you, what five wrestlers would you get? And he said, Randy Orton, Randy Orton, Randy Orton, Randy Orton, and Randy Orton. Bob Orton Jr. Randy Orton is a better athlete. He's got a better physique. Bob Orton Jr. was a better worker. And and this just this showed it again at a guy that was fucking semi retired and doing this part time came in and stole the fucking show. Anyway, everybody's timing and ring positioning was perfect. The fans went ape shit over everything. They even did they did the spot where they teased Garvin and Stomper breaking up because there was a duck spot where the heels ducked and a fucking Ronnie hit Stomper. And then they faced the first time I ever saw this was Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee in 1977 after they'd had that long program. And then Lawler switched baby face. Errant fucking shot. They're mad at each other. The heels are egging them on and there. And all of a sudden they look at each other and draw back and then turn and punch both heels. Boom. And then it keeps going. Um, Slater and Orton obviously were an incredible heel team. They kept Milk and Garvin finally getting the tag to Stomper. And then finally, they did a perfect false tag where the referees distracted didn't see it. And then they did a little bit more blatant false tag where because first the first one, not everybody saw because it was a close one. But then they got the second false tag, and that was a bit more obvious, and people are starting to rumble, and they're going to go for the third one. And after the third one, Stomper would come in and goddamn the referee would try to stop him and he'd just go berserk and fucking start the big comeback and just lay waste to everybody. And it'd be craziness and a double DQ. But when they went to the fucking third false take, Mac McMurray saw it and let him come in. (laughs) Am I over you motherfucker? (laughs) He fucking sucked. Cause they were calling this whole thing on the fly, but Mac hadn't refereed in 20 years and he, you know, and he wasn't one of the 
premier referees in the world ever anyway, as he saw it. So it killed the start of the pop for Stomper's comeback because he just started making it anyway. Uh, but but they got him back when Stomper pulled his fucking boot off, which everybody remembered and went crazy with beating everybody up with it. And they called the double DQ and the heels bailed. It, but except for the finish, the fans loved this. It was a flawless match in terms of work and professionals doing what they did. And, you know, and that to me was the match of the night. Anyway, next up was the famous interview where Jim Ross met New Jack for the first time. And I'm looking back 25 years later at Jim Ross's face going, my God, I may never work in major television again. <laughs> this is when New Jack did it. Okay, first of all, the Night of Legends card had been booked, obviously, at least, at finished at more than four weeks out and before the gangsters became uh, started in the territory. I think they had just started and maybe done one TV or whatever at that point. So to get them on the show, I wanted them to do a live interview. And to be honest, as everybody knows, especially at that point in time with New Jack and Mustafa both, it was better to hear New Jack talk than to see the gangsters wrestle because they were so fucking green. But New Jack, it was incredible on the microphone from day one. And so I had told him, I said, he, this was, I think, where we might have got the idea of the posse. Or it might have been on TV, but he he kept bringing friends with him from Atlanta. They'd all ride up together. And he had this guy that didn't wrestle, but boy, he looked like a badass, and he's dressed like a thug. I said, have him go out with you and Mustafa. It was, you know, numbers game. I think one TV brought like six people. But so out comes New Jack and Mustafa and this fucking friend of New Jack's. And they're playing, I don't know, it was some kind of public enemy something. I don't remember what the song was. Can't Do trust you? It. Yeah. Can't trust it. Okay. Can't trust this. Whatever the fuck. I'm starting to do MC Hammer now or whatever. But it was this, these horns and this whining. And it was the goddamnedest of, of, it was a noise. It was noise and it fit them. And here comes New Jack and Mustafa and they're both carrying axe handles. And New Jack's friend has his hand in a fucking backpack, like you get, like he's got a fucking Glock in the fucking backpack. <laughs> and he never took it out of the bag the whole time. He's carrying. He's looking around. I said, "There, you, he's your security guy, right?" So he's looking around with a Glock and a backpack. And the only the only bad that New Jack was still at that point, and actually he may never have quit this habit. But they're a tag team out there. But he's cutting a promo, I and me instead of us and we. He's like, "You can't beat me, and I'm going to beat you." Whatever. But there's Mustafa who couldn't talk, but he looked deranged. He's doing the fucking wide eyes and he's stuffing his finger. He's picking his finger up. His, he's got the goddamn third joint of his finger all the way up his fucking nostril. And he's fucking shaking that fucking shaking his head and shaking the, the ax handle. And New Jack, over the course of this five minute interview, works himself into the point of insanity. I have never even lost myself as much as, as he did, which, and that's why it, he was great. At, he was the most unique, accomplished promo guy in the business at that point. There, nobody else could have done any of this shit. And to be honest, he couldn't do anybody else's shit. You couldn't tell him what to say. He wouldn't remember it. He wouldn't say it right. But if you just said, go out there and talk about the Rock and Roll Express and make white people mad... This was incredible. And he did. And then, you know, actually he did all of his shit, you know, at first, um, you know, the, the, the NAACP can kiss my black ass and fuck all y'all basically. And then Jr. steers him back to the rock and roll. Cause that's who the actual opponents are going to be. And, and that's when new Jack, this was a great fucking line. When you think about it for making people convinced that, regardless of what you think about wrestling, this guy's going to fuck the rock and roll express up. He said, I done beat brothers. That's been in jail for murder. I done beat brothers. That's been in jail for molesting their own kids. Do you think now Ricky and Robert, they might beat me wrestling, but you think they're going to beat me fighting. And the way he was saying it and the way he looked, it, <laughs> 
Honestly, I wish we hadn't been in East Tennessee because if this had been in Philadelphia or what a big major metropolis, we'd have drawn some money. But instead, in just a couple of the cities, it drew some money, and otherwise, the gangsters were too rough for those towns. But anyway, <laughs> he told everybody to kiss his black ass, and then do you remember what his finishing line, the last thing he said was? And bear in mind, this is August 1994. I remembered it being kissed my black ass because he said the NAACP sellouts. Yeah. And he starts naming everyone kiss my black ass. Kiss my black ass. And as he's pulling back from the microphone, he added, and that's the bottom line. Oh, I, I swear. And I popped because I'm like, fuck, Steve Austin was a fan of the gangsters. But the people were flipping over this because they're like, what the fuck? By the time he finished talking, they remember they were leaning over the railing to take swats at him when they fucking went back. That was like nothing else I've ever experienced live because me and at least several of the other smart fans there from Fan Week had been reading about him in The Observer, but I had not yet seen New Jack or heard New Jack. So then he gets in the ring with Jim Ross and he starts off with a little humor. He goes, you know, you silenced Malcolm X, you silenced Medgar Evers, now you've even silenced Arsenio Hall. Yeah, you took him off the air. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. But he just, I've never seen anyone just like you said, it was almost like he was possessed. It was the most impressive thing maybe I've ever seen anyone do promo-wise live. And now think about this. The biggest wrestling crowd he had ever been in front of in his life, I don't know what we had at our television taping. If we had 300, 400, or whatever. The biggest crowd he'd ever been in front of for a wrestling show, well, it would have been at the Marietta show at the Cobb Civic Center where I first saw him when he was working for Sammy Kent in North Georgia. Um, when we had 1,000 people there. Just barely. And otherwise, it would have been 200, 250. And all of a sudden, he's in the Knoxville Civic Coliseum talking to Jim Ross, and the building sold out. And he's on TV. We got a, we got a videotape out of this. We got a tel- an episode of the television show. And it, he's, But that's what I say. He worked himself over the course of the thing. He started getting more confident and more into it and more worked up. And he worked himself up to where he was fucking probably legally insane by the time he finished this fucking thing. And that's what he did with all his promos. He got so into being him that he was telling the truth by the time he was finished in his mind <laughs> as to what he was. It was it was it, anyway, it was something to see. What did you tell Jim Ross in advance of that? Had he seen footage of them already or did he go into that not having ever seen them or heard them before? I think he had s- was that when he, oh shit, was he doing our TV at that point or was that no. when he started? No, Bob that's Cottle when he started. was still doing TV, yeah. Yeah, that's, so, yeah, I told him, I said, hey, you know, these guys are going to be a little, a little edgy. <laughs> you couldn't prepare for that, but, you know, you did see that look on JR's face like, ah, uh, my, my major league television career may be over with. Um, But anyway, but that, and, and that's, of course, now, when it came to having the matches, they had the Rock and Roll Express to work with. So that was good. And then I brought the Heavenly Bodies in, so that was good. But that's soon after why I added D'Lo Brown, because at least D'Lo could work. Because Mustafa was so big and so strong, and he looked great, but he wasn't fluid, and you couldn't really move him around anywhere. He wasn't going to go anyway. And New Jack was just New Jack, right? So D'Lo was the Buddy Roberts of the team. He was the guy that could take the bumps, and if you needed to beat him, you could beat him, but the other guys would still have their heat, and it worked out, and, you know, D'Lo ended up with a nice career off of that because he ended up going places and making more money than New Jack and Mustafa ever dreamed of because he could work and and manage to transition into not being a complete psychopath. Anyway. Were you building up originally to gangsters versus thrill seekers after the gangsters got through with the rock and roll? I had I had not got that far, but to be honest with you, I I would not have, I would not have done that at that point because that would have been worlds colliding with greenness. There'd have been no leader, as we'll get to in a minute. Um, we go from there to the backstage interviews, which contained one of the best ones and one of the worst ones I've ever seen. The first interview with Brian Lee, Chris Candido, and Tammy Fitch. Tammy was our hottest heel. And it, 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 she had more heat than I did because at least the people, they were kind of used to me, but that fucking bitch, that arrogant, obnoxious, condescending, whiny. Oh my God. 
just incredible pro and Brian and Candido were Brian was good. Candido was very good. Tammy was great. But we just told them the match and they did that. And then <clears throat> on the opposing side of the thing, here comes Rock and Roll Express, and they brought in Ricky Gibson. Yeah. And let me say that for those of you who do not know, and I have to I keep forgetting there's people that don't know, Robert Gibson's older brother, Ricky Gibson was a wrestler first and was Robert's first tag team partner. That was the first Robert and Ricky. Ricky Gibson was without doubt one of the best young baby faces that I've ever seen live in person in 45 years of watching wrestling. He was an amazing athlete. He could sell. He was six feet tall and 220 pounds, but he could sell like Ricky Morton but he had fire in his comeback. Unlike either Ricky Morton or Robert Gibson, he just had an incredible amount of fire and, and the punches and the, he was the first guy I saw doing missile drop kicks, drop kicks off the, the turnbuckles. He took that big high backdrop where if you, he got a guy that could boost him, he would go, his head would go straight up and then suddenly he'd flip and his head would be pointed straight down and his feet would be straight up. And by the time he landed, he'd land flat as a board on his back. If he was chasing the, the heel manager, he would run and jump over the top rope and land on his feet on the floor and never miss a stride chasing him. He was so athletic. They brought Ricky Gibson in to Memphis in 1974, right as I got started going to the live matches in Louisville. And Lawler had just injured Jackie Fargo and broken his ribs and won the Southern heavyweight title. It was the process of passing the torch. And now Lawler was the champion and Fargo was injured. <clears throat> and they brought in Ricky Gibson. And he had such fire and they had such great matches. That was the first vertical suplexes I ever saw. They were ahead of, they were two 23 year old guys doing shit that were, was ahead of their time in, in the Tennessee territory. But it still obviously wasn't, they weren't doing community theater. This were these were athletes performing at a high level, not joke wrestlers, but they were taking good bumps and they were doing and bleeding and Ricky Gibson, actually, because business was so hot at that point after Lawler turned on Fargo, one of the matches with Lawler and Ricky Gibson sold out to Mid-South Coliseum. And Ricky had only been in the territory like two, three months. And then they brought Fargo back and they gave Ricky the rub. They had Fargo in Ricky Gibson's corner. And it sold out again. And then that transitioned back to Lawler and Fargo for another run. But off of that, Ricky Gibson, and to an extent, Robert, just by being his brother, was over in the Tennessee territory for the next 10 years. It was incredible. But Ricky Gibson inside the ring as a baby face, as an athlete, there's, there's very few people anywhere. Comp nobody comparable today that had the whole package that young. Having said that in this interview, it highlighted the one thing that Ricky Gibson could never do speak. He couldn't do a promo. Not only that, but this was after Ricky was retired because it, it, even when he was still in, in the business, he started getting injuries because of all that shit, because of the shit he did. He had a bad back. He had a knee injury. Then the, there was, then he, he had to, I think several other injuries to his one knee. And then by this time he'd been in a car wreck that, that finished him in the ring for good. And he was still walking with a cane. But now at that point, Ricky Morton's in this promo. He was 40 and looked 20, and Ricky Gibson was 40 and looked 60. And it was, just, it was sad, but we brought Ricky Gibson back because not only was he a star in Southeastern, but the longtime fans knew that he was Robert's brother. Ricky Morton introduced him as the man that had stood behind the Rock and Roll Express to you know explain why he hadn't been a part of the big thing with them. But it, it, so Ricky was there to be handcuffed or sit next to Tammy Fitch so she wouldn't interfere in the Smoky Mountain Tag Team title match. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll tell you one more Ricky gives the story before, before we move on to the match. You know, he I've told you this story, haven't I? He was involved in the single greatest ang wrestling angle I've ever seen for believability. Do you know which one it was? I'm not sure. Was it the one about making fun of his mom? No. It was the, it was the tire tool deal. But it, it may have been to say that, no, it, it was, no, because that was Jimmy Hart and the first family. Break his fingers so he can't talk to his mother. That was when they had Robert down. They had done, 
the remember the second forgotten Tupelo concession stand brawl with Ricky and Robert Gibson against Wayne Ferris and Larry Latham, the Blonde Bombers? Yes, 1980. Okay. Then uh, on the way back to Memphis, and kids, they did this type of thing back in those days. Ricky, in the car, toweled his face. In other words, you take a towel and you grind the top couple of layers of skin off so that you have scabs. And then he hard weighed his eye himself so that he had a black eye and his eye was closed up. So the next morning, they, they announced Ricky Gibb. They played the tape and they said, but Ricky Gibson is injured and can't be here today. So Robert's on his own, right? Robert's here as a single and somewhere or another, I can't remember all the particulars, but it got into a deal where Wayne Ferris, Larry Latham, and, ma and their manager, Sergeant Danny Davis, my OVW partner, Danny Davis, would jump Robert and beat shit out of him, right? Ricky Gibson stayed back at the hotel. Back in those days, the baby faces stayed at the Admiral Benbow, which was down not far from Channel 5, but, but anyway, a bunch of the girls used to get rooms there on Friday nights because they knew the guys that came back from the Tupelo or the spot shows or wherever on Friday night stayed there and then did Memphis TV the next morning. So most of the girls, they didn't have tickets to the studio. You had to write in and get those and bullshit. They just, and they didn't go to the matches on Friday night unless they were from out of town and then came into Memphis, but the Memphis girls would just get the rooms and have the cold cuts and the beer on ice and all that stuff on Friday night, ready to go when the guys got in. Whether it was the babyface group of girls that went to the babyface hotel or the heel group of girls that went to the heels hotel. Anyway. Did any so of the, the girls ever turn from the babyface side to the heel side and join the other squad? Well, yes, sometimes they would they would actually be double agents, but the thing is they wouldn't admit <laughs> but no, they wouldn't admit to the heels that they were fucking with the baby faces. They wouldn't admit to the baby face they were fucking with the heels because they was they were afraid they would get cast off by the other side. But anyway. <laughs> So Ricky is in Ricky Gibson is in his room and some of the girls are hanging out watching the wrestling show with him because it's live on channel five, right? Live as it happens. <clears throat> so he's got four or five girls in his room and they're watching the wrestling show and the fucking blonde bombers jump Robert and beat the shit out of him. And he fucking gets up and goes, motherfucker, and he grabs his car keys and he storms out, right? And this is when you walked out the fucking hotel door, you're in the parking lot if you're on the first floor, right? He storms out the door of the hotel, gets in a trunk of his, opens his trunk of his car, gets a fucking tire tool out where they can see it. Now they're shitting, Ricky, Ricky, no, no, nah, motherfuckers, gets in the car with the tire tool and fucking cuts mud and fucking peels rubber out of the fucking parking lot, right? And the girls are like, oh, shit, what the fuck? They keep watching the wrestling show. About 10 minutes later, there's a segment where the Blonde Bombers are, are having their tag match with a couple of job guys, right? And, and Sergeant Danny is sitting at ringside. And, and Danny at the time, because he's the sergeant, he has the army helmet on. All of a sudden, the girls in Ricky Gibson's room see Ricky Gibson bust into the fucking studio carrying the tire tool that they had just seen him get out of the trunk of his car, and he hits the fucking ring. And Ferris and Latham dive out, and they're running everywhere, and Danny stands up, and he's about to run, and Ricky gets through the ropes and takes that tire tool and raises it, and he's standing on the apron. Danny's on the floor, right? Danny looks up, and I've asked him about this afterwards. Because he did, I mean, this was not called. It was like Ricky Gibbons is going to hit the ring with a tire tool. You're on your own. He saw Ricky coming down with that tire tool, and he grabbed that helmet and raised it up off his head about three inches or so. When Ricky hit that helmet with that tire tool, it put a fucking hole in it. As big as, <laughs> big as a goddamn walnut, the end of the end, with the thing that turns the fucking lug nuts went straight through that fucking helmet. If Danny hadn't raised it up off his head, it would have gone an inch into his fucking skull. Wow. The girls believed that angle. And they were fucking all these guys. And they knew what they were like outside the ring. But they still were not smart. Nobody officially talked smart to them. And even though they could still see when some things were not right, they were fucking shit, and they were afraid Ricky was going to go to fucking jail, or did they call the cops, What, ha et cetera, et cetera. 
And so at that point, you did have sometimes a situation where even the girls that are sleeping with these guys were convinced that what they were seeing was real in front of them. Anyway, my favorite shoot angle of all time. In this match, Smoky Mountain Tag Team title, the Rock and Roll Express against Lee and Candido, Ricky Gibson's handcuffed Tammy Sitch, or Fitch at that point. And I love the camera shot. Brian Lee's walking around ringside, and there's 15-year-old girls standing up on the hanging over the bicycle rack, screaming, fuck you, fucking putting their fingers right up in their faces, the heels' faces, fuck you, fuck you, die, you cocksucker. <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> where do you see this anymore? Now the fans sitting there going, oh, we're cheering for him. We don't want to hurt his feelings. Um, Candido was a natural. At this, he'd been a, in Smoky Mountain for a year now. And he moved and looked like a 15-year veteran. When he had come in, he had all the tools. He just didn't have the psychology. He didn't have the body language. He didn't have the knowledge of what to do, when, and et cetera. But he'd worked with the rock and roll. He'd worked with the Armstrongs. He'd worked with the bodies. He'd worked with all these guys or ridden with all these guys. That was the whole idea. You have guys that in, the, in your territory that have been in business for 20 years, 10 years, and one year. And And anyway, he was a bumping machine. He had the psychology for the whole thing, and the people were eating this match up too. It's a common thread. Brian Lee was a pretty good heel at this time. But in the ring, he was number four here in this situation as far as, you know, level of work. But once again, it was refreshing to see a match called in the ring and on the fly uh, like this one because they kept it exciting. They kept it moving, but it doesn't look choreographed or pre-planned. There had to be some peaks and valleys because every once in a while, especially because Rick and Robert are calling it because you, Brian Lee and Chris Candido were not going to presume to try to call a match to the Rock and Roll Express. So every once in a while, the heels had to bail out and fucking regroup so that Ricky might tell the referee something. Poor Hildebrand was a fucking master communicator back in those days. Or, or then at one point, Ricky is actually calling the next round of shit to Brian Lee while they're squaring off with their fists up, looking like they're going to fight. But the floor camera, you can kind of tell Ricky's face. If you know what to look what you're looking for, that he's calling something while they're fucking, you know, shadow boxing with each other. It, it, but anyway, um, they finally get, they got some, a set of heat on Ricky Morton. Imagine that. And Brian Lee did fuck up some kind of tag team move. He was going to have Candido slingshot, you know, the old kangaroos, fabulous kangaroos slingshot boomerang yeah. into a diving clothesline off the ropes by Brian Lee, but it did not work. We have, we put a crowd shot over it and I swear to God, then they tried it again to give Ricky an opening to hot tag and he fucked it up a different way. But otherwise, the the match, the people ate it up, and it was a good match, and Brian's, you know, the green guy there. But then finally, who gets the – Robert Gibson gets the tag. The comeback got him back. Ricky Gibson, of course, foils Tammy. She tries to use the mace or the hairspray. He grabs that away. Robert makes the assist, and Ricky pins Brian Lee, and they win the tag team titles. And the people go crazy and jump up and down and throw shit in the air. Um, That – except for, you know, that would have been what a lot of people would call a better tag match than the Legends tag match because there were more bumps in it, but it wasn't a better match than the Legends tag match because there were obvious mistakes. Therefore, there weren't any obvious mistakes in the Legends tag match. It, it, the only mistake was the referee seeing the blind tag and a fan could not detect that. But uh, to me... As I always told him in wrestling school and every company I ever scouted for, which is all of them, I'd rather have a degree of difficulty of five and an execution of 10 than the other way around. You try to reach too far and you get sloppy and you start blowing shit, it tells the people you're working, which that's the one thing that must be avoided. The buzz killer in wrestling, the ultimate buzz killer is when you break down and show there's obvious cooperation, which is why most modern matches can never be flawless. Anyway. Did you know already at this period of time that you were going to have Brian Lee again after the Evil Undertaker match 
at SummerSlam that year? Did you no, know he was coming I, back? No, I didn't because I was finishing him up and I was ready for him to go. He'd been there since the start. I couldn't fucking get rid of him. And I don't mean that the way it sounds now, but it was time for him to go. I didn't want to leave him without a fucking job, but I couldn't get anybody to take him. And finally, when that happened, because he was friends with Taker, you know, before the incident in Nashville, uh, but he was friends with Taker. Taker put the word in for that deal. And besides the fact that it died a fucking horrible, grisly death, the whole thing, the fake Undertaker, under faker, whatever, that's when Vince McMahon had come to me and fucking said, well, you know, uh, Brian Lee, he's, he's still working for you, right? I said, well, yeah, I'm, you know, whenever you need him, Vince, I can finish him up. I'm still booking him. He said, well, he told me, pal, that he was ready to come up here full time. Anytime he could finish up. He, he didn't, he didn't have to leave any notice. Basically, Brian said, anytime you want to book me, I'll be here and I don't have to finish up. <laughs> so then the first thing Vince McMahon does is come to me and tell me, Hey, uh, fucking he's, here's what he said, because if he will do it to me for Vince, then he'll do it to Vince for fucking Ted Turner or whatever. And he wasn't bright enough to realize promoters stuck together, talk together. So I can't remember everything that I, I've, you know, I didn't just go back and cuss Brian out at that point. I just pretty much beat him for the rest of his smoky mountain wrestling existence. I took him back to get some mileage out of him uh, when they ixnade the underfaker. But then I think it was by, wasn't it, wasn't it around Thanksgiving? Cause I mean, he had a name and he'd been there that long. I wasn't going to fire him on the spot. I was pissed, but I think I finished him up some kind of way in the deal where he was a, he was a fall guy for Chris Candido to bring in Chris's friend, Boo Bradley. And then, then Chris got, uh, then, was it fucking who was Mick Foley's partner against Candido and Boo? It was Mick Foley and Boo. It was Mick Foley and Brian Lee, maybe, against Chris and Boo, and then Boo became Mick's partner. Yeah, that. And then when Boo became the best, so that way I eased Brian out of the picture. That's what it was. <clears throat> so anyway, or was it Lance Storm? Now that I think about it, I'm not sure. I don't fucking know. Anyway, it's not on this DVD, folks. And here we come up on the Knoxville history package segments. And I explained um, earlier what we did. I went out either with a cameraman and Les Thatcher, or sometimes I just had the high eight camera. And I wrote and produced the, the voiceover copy, edited most of these spots, used my wrestling memorabilia collection. Plus I had uh, Ron Wright gave me some of his scrapbooks to copy stuff. And Nancy Caldwell, Whitey's widow had given me some things to, to make copies of newspaper ads, Joe Kazana, gave me that tape of his grandfather, John Kazana's wide world wrestling show. The only one that still exists from December of 72. It's on the internet, but where the Ron Wright footage came from and the oldest Jerry Lawler match on tape. Um, I had a bunch of pictures and programs from Knoxville from the seventies. So in these segments, three and four mem uh, minutes at a time over the eight weeks previous to night of legends, we did a brief history of Knoxville wrestling from the fifties forward taken from the TV segments and, and et cetera, that we could get a hold of and less uh, voiced them over and hosted them. And then we would update the people. It was kind of like a control center too, where we would update the people on the card, just added to the night of legends, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and then we played a bunch of those. I left some of the individual star profiles that we did for later on. I'll explain why, but then I did make one mistake. I, it, I'm I'm kidding you, Uncle Les. I love you to death, but I let Les Thatcher. This was all his segment to host, produce, run it, do whatever you want. And if Les hosted the Oscars, it would be a three day telecast. This was a long ceremony, but it still picked up at the end. Um, and I went absolutely bullshit when I looked at the monitor in the locker room and saw that they were starting the ceremony. They put one of the old beat up wooden tables that the Knoxville Civic Coliseum had, they'd charge us $67.50 every time we broke one. And I tried to break every one in the building so they'd get some new ones because they were all the shits. But no tablecloth. Literally a fucking cardboard box with the plaques in it and a bare fucking table <laughs> sitting there in the ring from a sold-out crap. And by the, they were starting by the time I saw the monitor. And I went bullshit. Oh, my God. But anyway, 
uh, Les and Phil Rainey, who was the program director at the time at, at Fox 43 in Knoxville. He was, of course, Les's broadcast partner for Southeastern Wrestling in the glory days, and he's the Joe Franklin of Tennessee. Uh, Les and Phil Rainey hosted it. They brought out for recognition a quick loop around the ring and a handshake. Uh, Sandy Scott, Billy Wicks, poor Billy. We had to put a crowd shot where Billy got stuck on the middle rope trying to step over because of his bad hip. But Billy Wicks was the toughest motherfucker in the building probably at night. Could have beat anybody in a shoot. Did he have a lot of history um, in East Tennessee? He did not, but he was still alive, and we just we we invited him if he wanted to come, and he was friends with some of these folks. So, but he primarily he was a Memphis name. But uh, Sarah Lee, Tommy Weathers, Tommy Weathers was an old Continental referee, but he uh, also he became a heel manager at one point in the eighties down there. He became, turned from heel referee to a full fledged manager. And Tommy Weathers was about five foot three and maybe one hundred and twenty pounds. He made Brian Hildebrand look like Luger. Right. And he had a be- a beard, a long beard down to his stomach. And just a he was a such a heat getting manager and such a little wiry fuck. He's the one that had the loaded cane gimmick for real. In Alabama and places like that, the people were trying to cut him. They were attacking him. He was so much smaller than everybody else. He hollowed out his walking cane and poured lead into the fucking tip. And then let it harden, and the fucking head of his cane was like a 10-pound fucking golf ball. And he would hit motherfuckers with that when they'd try to fucking cut him or fuck with him or whatever. He was a wiry little fuck. Uh, Ronnie West, who was one of the great announcers and and had worked every Southern Territory, worked in the office in Georgia. Referees. Refere- uh, what did I say? Great announcers. Oh, great referees. I'm sorry. He was not a great announcer. That's one thing Ronnie West did not have in his <laughs> fucking repertoire. Uh, the aforementioned Mac McMurray, Bob Polk, who was a, he, at that time he was managing the Knoxville Civic Coliseum. He'd been partners with Ron Fuller and the hockey team, and he had uh, helped in Southeastern. He, you know, he was a friend of wrestling for years there. Corsica Joe, Dandy Jack Donovan. That's an interesting lump, one. Because still he, with lumps on his head from Tojo's wooden shoes. Because he was like run off from the wrestling business. If you listen to him and you listen to other guys who were around there and there are witnesses to when he was attacked, he was like run off. What made you get him? I mean, it's such a cool thing for you to bring him back after all those years. Well, the thing is, he was run off from, from Memphis because Tojo and Fargo and Jerry Jarrett beat him up after he got in that fucking beef with Tojo in Louisville, right? About killed him. However... Yeah. Yeah. Over in East Tennessee, he was never a draw. Danny Jack Donovan was never a draw in Memphis. But in Knoxville, uh, he was a pretty he was used pretty well in a, at a main event level. And with a lot of these guys, we had gone to uh uh Ron Wright and said, Hey, who do who lives around? Because see I mean, some guys we paid, and we'll get into that in a moment, but a lot of the legends, we said, look, we're honoring all of you guys. It's going to be a great night. There's going to be a meet and greet where you get a chance to, you know, mingle with uh, all of your old friends and the fans. We will get you a hotel. We'll pay for your gas if you want to come over. And that's what a lot of these folks did because they just wanted to see everybody. And so, you know, in that case, Danny Jack Donovan, sure, come on. Here we go. And he's friends with Jim White who was one time run out of the Memphis territory too, for different reasons. But uh, Jim White lived up in Eastern Kentucky at the time and had worked in Knoxville for years and years. And people remembered him. Uh, Joe, cause I'm go ahead. Had you tried to contact Ron Fuller about coming in? I know he was in probably Cincinnati at this time with his hockey team, but obviously that's, that's the one big gap there is there's no one from the Fuller family or from, you know, really the, well, I guess you do have well, some Southeastern guys there, but you just don't have him or Robert. Well, yeah. Well, see, Robert had been working for me, and Jimmy Golden had been working for me, but at this time they were in, in WCW, and they couldn't. And I had actually asked Bob Polk, I said, you think Ron? He's like, oh, Ron's not doing too much with wrestling these days. It'd be another six years before Ron Fuller stepped foot in a fucking a wrestling arena while a match was going on, and that was one he was promoting himself. He was complete. So, no, I... I I actually tried. I said, can we, can we get a videotape or anything from Ron? But it just didn't happen at that point. He wasn't in and I didn't have Ron's number. 
you know, but I, I sent words and feelers by everybody that, you know, I think he and Bob were still in business at that point in, in the, on the Cincinnati team, ask Ron sometime. But anyway, I can't remember exactly who all or how many efforts we made, but yes, yes, that was, I still somewhere have the, the working list that I, I, cause Phil Higgerson was another guy I couldn't make it. Tommy Gilbert, I'd invited. He, he said at first he'd come, but then he couldn't come. Cause he had something going on. It was 300 miles, whatever. Were you talking to so, Dennis at that time? Dennis uh, Condry? No, nobody knew where Dennis was then. Remember we, after 19, eight, early 1989, when he left WCW the second time on the original midnight, midnight angle, when they fucked that up, we didn't see or talk to him till 2004. So no, at that time I had no idea of it, where he was anywhere, but Phil Higgerson was in Jackson. I figured he could ride over with fucking Tommy Gilbert, but they couldn't come anyway. <laughs> we had Joe Kazana there for his grandfather, John Kazana. Uh, Frank Morell came over the angel who helped me so much. Frank was a great guy. He was, <clears throat> he was a good wrestler. He, he had good work and he looked like such a gimmick. He had such a different look. Um, but really it was just, he could teach you so much with the things he said. Like one time in the summer of 83, we're riding to a spot show. And that's when we were down there and, you know, in the, on the fucking buttermilk run in Georgia and just making the guarantee every night. And I was bitching about, oh, geez, got to go all this way for $50. He said, Hey, you ever seen $50 worth of ham and eggs on a plate? <laughs> well, that's okay. And and then he's also the one I said, well, you think I should, I wear my jacket. It's 117 in this fucking armory. He said, if it's too hot to wear your gimmick, it's too hot to work. Oh, good point taken. Daddy Frank. Anyway, uh, Frank Morrell was there. Jody Bass, who was Sam Bass's widow. Uh, she was also friends with, uh, Nancy Caldwell and was able to get me some of the, uh, uh historical material for this. And, all these people, as you'll remember, they're getting polite applause. Nobody's hooting at it. Most of most people to this point, these this was not a stellar list of names, and they're it, it didn't take as long for them to go through as it has for us to talk about them. But they're getting a handshake and they're getting polite applause, and and everybody was respectful. Yeah. And then Ricky Gibson, and once that they announced Ricky Gibson, and he of course he'd already been out in the match, but then people start getting into it a little bit more, and that's where I start on the entrances airing on the DVD, the profiles from the TV show of people uh, where we had mentioned Ricky. And then that's where also the talent gets a chance to accept their plaque and speak to the people. And after Ricky Gibson next was Doug Furness, who got a, a good round of applause. Then I had less announced because, and they didn't give a shit and they liked it this way better. Anyway, I had less announced because Slater and Orton were heels, right? Earlier, how can they come out and all of a sudden say thank you? So Les Thatcher announced, ladies and gentlemen, Dick Slater and Bob Orton Jr. have refused to come out and accept their awards because they were screwed in their match earlier. And the people boo them again. Boo, fuck you guys. It was, it was perfect, right? And then Les announces that he's accepting Bullet Bob Armstrong's because Bullet Bob is wrestling in the main event. So he takes that plaque. Then we introduced Nelson Royal, former world junior heavyweight champion. We aired a TV news clip that Nelly had had from the Carolinas about his wrestling and his rodeo riding. And you know, just what a great man Nelson was. He trained so many guys. People gave him a nice pop. Good friend then of Les's. He, <clears throat> and a former tag partner of Les's. And then here comes the Mongolian stomper. And the video that we played, I was great that I had some old 70s Memphis video of him just beating everybody up, but inclu it included him beating a bejesus out of Hulk Hogan in his rookie year and fucking just turning shit over on all these fucking guys. And then the one acknowledgement, Archie had said, can I say something? I said, Archie, do whatever you want. Because we had been using him since we really got started in spots once or twice a year of wild match against Kevin Sullivan or a special partner or something where it wouldn't overdo it. But we were getting to the point where, you know, if Stomper was evergreen once a year, we were going to do something, whatever, but he, everywhere he had been in his active career, when he started speaking, it killed his aura. 
but we didn't need that anymore because he, he would always have his aura at that point that he had. <clears throat> so I said, go ahead. I said, Archie, say whatever you want to say. So for the first time that I'm aware of, I don't think he ever broke down and started doing promos in Knoxville in Southeast, which is probably why he was over there so long. Um, but he spoke, he came out, the people cheered and he basically just thanked the people and said, and told them that he wasn't from Knoxville, but for the past however long he'd made it his home and it was always his favorite place. And he thanked the people for all of their years of support and that gets a pop. Yeah. It kind of exposed the business a little bit, but at the same time, you know, all the, all the people that had been in jail knew about Archie already. Right. Then here comes Ronnie Garvin. And now people are really with it. And Ronnie says, hey, if I could live here, I would. Knoxville, which is true. Knoxville was always my favorite place. He was living in Charlotte at the time. But that's why I was able to get him over there for 300 bucks a night. I guess I won't hurt anybody's fucking feelings saying that now. Because he loved Knoxville. And he was a former NWA world champion. Named Good Worker. Understood the fucking psychology of the, the, the territory. And I'm trying to build... As we go, if you notice, each person is is more of a main event guy and more of going to get more of a fucking pop is more more of a star, right? Each succeeding person. The next choice will be for the people who order this at jimcornette.com and watch it happen now are going to go, what the fuck? But the next team out was Don and Al Green. because And they still got a pop. And I guarantee Don and Al Green had not appeared as a tag team in Knoxville since Ron Fuller had bought the territory in 1974. But they not only still got a pop, but because of these segments, the profiles on television. Imagine that. I told the people who were too young who they were and made them important in the previous two months. So they're both gray haired. They'd been retired for fucking, you know, nearly 20 years at that point. <clears throat> but we showed video. I've got that match from Memphis of Al Green and Jackie Fargo, the first wrestling sellout at the Coliseum, where it l- just literally looks like Al Green is drawn back and punching Jackie Fargo in the face repeatedly as hard as he can. And that's all they're doing is just punching each other in the fucking face. It's like a goddamn cross between a saloon fight and a real life Rocky movie. And Don and Al Green were the top Tag, heel tag team overall in the state of Tennessee, West Tennessee, East Tennessee, Central Tennessee, anywhere in Tennessee from 1959 until 1974. So I put them in that order because they were so historically important. They had to come after even Garvin and Stomper, but you know who had to come next. And that's why the greens had to be there because who was more important than Don and Al green Ron and Don Wright. They hadn't been together in the Civic Coliseum at that point. Once again, since Ron Fuller had bought the territory, Don mostly retired. Ron had worked for Ron Fuller. And Ron had worked for everybody, obviously. But we advertised it as the first time that the Wright brothers had been in the Knoxville Civic Coliseum together in 20 years. And they're walking down the aisle to no music, and the people give them a standing ovation. So we just start panning the crowd and see all the people applauding them. Some of those people in the building were not born the last time that these guys were there together and they're standing up and applauding them because their parents and their grandparents had told them, if you like wrestling, these were the fucking guys, right? So they were, and and the TV, they knew. They were over. And that's where I got a chance to show the video of Ron's promo with Big Jim Hess, really the only existing video of Ron doing what he did every week on live TV. There's nothing like it anywhere else in wrestling, anywhere else in the world today. There wasn't anything like it anywhere else in wrestling at that time. Old brother Ron just going out there and being the fucking heat-seeking missile hillbilly telling people off on TV every weekend. And so the then Ron and Don Wright get their plaques. And then we did a fan mail vote. Spectrum Rent sponsored this, by the way. So they paid for it. <clears throat> it was a shoot. Who was the greatest wrestler in Knoxville history? Send your vote to such and such address back when people still knew how to write and send mail. And Ron Wright won that. 
awards. Bob Armstrong got close, but Ron Wright won it. And then the very last award, we had Ron Wright turn around and present to Nancy Caldwell on, for, uh, on behalf of Whitey Caldwell and her family. When Ron mentioned Whitey's name, this was 1994, go back and watch the DVD. <laughs> he mentions it, the name of a man who was killed in 1972 and the people fucking popped. Is that going to happen to wrestling 22 years from now? Does anybody go, oh, Darby Allen? Yay! Whatever the fuck, right? And that's where we show Whitey's profile video and the Flowers story where Les, his voice cracks. And you know, it was so hard to find pictures. This was another legitimate story. It was hard to find wrestling pictures of Whitey Caldwell because he never sold his pictures at the matches. He didn't feel like that he should, he gave away autographs for free and he didn't feel like that he should sell his pictures to the fans that was taking advantage of him. But one time he had a picture taken with the Southeastern heavyweight title belt when the, or the, maybe it might've been the Tennessee heavyweight title at that point, but whatever Kazana's top title was because one of his little girl fans needed a kidney operation. So he sold the pictures and gave the kid the money. And that's the only one, that, this is from his wife. That's the only picture they ever sold of him at the matches. Where do you find baby faces like this anymore? Well, more importantly, where do you find photos? You couldn't find any videos. That was yeah, the only thing you're able to find? That Actually, that picture, and then there's a color picture that we got of, of Whitey and Les posed in the locker room that, that I think a fan took, or it, I say locker room, up against the old brick wall. And there was a couple, and there was some magazine pictures of Ron and Whitey in the Tennessee chain match, but there ain't a lot of pictures of Whitey Caldwell out there. And newspaper ads would have a grainy headshot of him or whatever. Anyway, so that was the, by the time that marathon ceremony got over and it's dressed up on video with the, um, with the entrance videos and all that stuff, but the people liked it. They sat there through the thing. It was a longer segment than we had planned. Nobody was disrespectful. Not one person got hooted. And they applauded afterwards when Les said, one more time for the Knoxville Wrestling Legends. It had been a 45-minute deal. That, that's part of what they came to see. You only get respect for history and for veterans when your program and your presentation gives people the idea that it's deserved and warranted. When you bring them out and make fucking clowns out of them, like they do on fucking Raw or whatever the fuck, or some of these other fucking promotions these days, then you teach people that they're deserving of no respect and they're clowns. And then you just lose another tool in your to toolkit of how to fucking draw. This legend ceremony that we did sold as many tickets as any single match on the card. <laughs> and it was better than a couple. Anyway, here here we come. Speaking of one, it was better than. Holy God almighty. We go to a VTR of the angle between the thrill seekers and the heavily bodies. The Of course, the thrill seekers were presented with a cake on television from their fans, and I come out and knock them, and they smash my face in the cake. And then suddenly on a fan's camera, uh, that trying to get an autograph from referee Mark Curtis, a little kid, suddenly uh, sees the thrill seekers being attacked in a parking lot by Jim Cornette and two men with masks over their faces because the heavenly bodies were supposedly banned from Smoky Mountain Wrestling and also because they were actually on the road for the WWF, so this was well done in full body suits. <laughs> but we beat them up in the parking lot, and then... That's where we come to the Thrill Seekers promo with Lance Storm and Chris Jericho from their kitchen table. So <sighs> Lance nor Chris, neither one, had ever done television interviews before because they'd never been on television before. They'd worked independence, they'd worked in Japan, and independence in Canada. They'd never even been in this country, much less on, on television. And I'm not knocking Chris or Lance either one when I say this because they have publicly come out and said this. They knew how to do moves before they got Smoky Mountain Wrestling, but they didn't understand working, and especially Lance because he got to spend more time there. But they were still so green, and and the the interview was, we were there for a while, and it was the best one we got. 
But basically, this whole match was booked. And then, of course, me and the bodies do a promo, and I do a, <laughs> about five minutes completely off the top of my head of, of, of old-time Southern heel bullshit with some 90s references. You know, uh, but <sighs> that's... Uh, the whole idea behind this match was I brought the thrill seekers in off seeing that video and we got the paperwork done because I thought sooner or later, the rock and roll express's time will run out and I've got to have a baby face team ready to go. And these guys look like a million dollars. They're dynamite. They're so athletic. We can settle them down like we could did with Candido, like we did with Glenn Jacobs, like we did all the green guys that we got and we put in the pools to be trained I said they can be slowed down and they can be smartened up and and personality will come out. But I've got to establish these guys as a team because there's so few babyface teams and these guys are fresh and new. And plus, I figured they'd be pussy magnets, as I've mentioned. And there were issues with that. I won't go over it now again. But, you know, they they didn't understand the 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 whole idea of selling the gimmicks and selling your gimmick at the merchandise table. Anyway... But so I had them go over well done in a preliminary program so that Rex King and Steve Dahl, they were fairly experienced. They could teach them a little something. And then I had the heavenly bodies back for a week from the WWF to put them over in all the towns every night, including on television to really kind of break the thrill seekers into another level. And of course, that's the same afternoon that Chris Jericho got in the ring to practice a shooting star press and broke his own arm. So, what we have here after the promos and the entrances are clipped <laughs> because of the music. But obviously we had the big introduction for the heavenly bodies and their music. And we're getting ready for the thrill seekers and the thrill seekers music plays. And all of a sudden the curtains at the back of the Knoxville civic Coliseum part and out comes a race car and it's revving its engine and the spotlight is on it. And it's the old misdirection play. I'd planned this from the start where everybody's looking at the fucking race car and we think the thrill seekers are in the race car. And then suddenly they jump from the back door, they jump into the ring and they jump start the match and the lights come up and everybody blows and off we go. Well, which is what happened, except when the lights come up and the jump start, besides the fact that Chris and Lance, and once again, this is not a knock, but as I go back and look now, after having seen them come so far in the past 25 years, they are both greener than fucking chlorophyll, and one of my baby faces has a broken right arm, and he's right-handed. So, this is the classic match that I thought this was going to be is anything but if you're looking for a great match. This is if you're looking for a great match where everybody's on the same page, this is fucking horrible. Because did I mention my baby faces are green as grass and one of them has a broken right arm. But especially for any of you aspiring young wrestlers out there, if you want to see the process of a veteran heel tag team leading two baby faces by the nose, telling them every move to make and what to do and keeping this thing together when it should have gone off the fucking rails at any given moment, this is possibly the best example I've ever seen of that. And we had JR cover the fucking arm broken thing caused by a motorcycle accident. You know, these guys are thrill seekers, right? They do all kinds of daring shit. <laughs> but for, for 15 or 20 minutes, the heavenly bodies, I th they could have had a match. They could have had a match with the legless guy in the AEW battle Royal, two paraplegics put at, at this point, I'm convinced Tom Pritchard and Jimmy Del Rey, could have had a match with anybody in the world because they did. Um, they shine Lance and Chris with teamwork moves that Lance and Chris have never seen before, and they're telling them to do it. <laughs> the old Southern style shit that poor Lance and Chris both were, but they're they're shining them with that. Lance uh, Chris is trying to throw left-handed backhand punches because his right arm is broken, but they they got him through the shine. Then they got some heat on Lance. And Jimmy Del Rey's work was so sharp and so underrated. They slowed it down a little bit and took their time, and they hit Lance with everything under the moon to build for the tag, finally the hot tag to Chris. And, of course, Chris makes a shitty left-handed comeback, 
but that wasn't the fucking problem anyway because we were going for two sets of heat because this was going to be the big one. Chris makes a little comeback, and Tom trips him, pulls him out, and runs his head into the post. And, of course, as we all know, being that his right arm was broken and he's right-handed, he went a little bit too deep in the well. (laughs) So now I've got two green baby faces, one of them with a broken right arm, and he's about to bleed to death. Ladies and gentlemen, I think, what do they call it, the Muda scale? Yeah. He looked like he looked like a tomato that had been thrown through a screen door. When have you seen more blood on a one human being live? Never. It was, and I'm I'm like, oh fuck. Well, but it got the people. And see, here's the thing. I've told this story before, but it fits here. A month earlier, on a spot show in front of 300 people in Eastern Kentucky, I had seen Chris do a fucking deal, where. He charged into the corner and the the heel moved and Chris dove and he went over the top turnbuckle, hit his head on the ring post and fell to the floor in one motion. And it looked good. And I immediately told him, don't ever do that again until I tell you. Because you dumb shits, you just risked your neck in front of 300 people at a fucking high school gym in, you know, fucking nowhere, Kentucky. But that looked like a million dollars. So the next time you do it, is going to be in front of a big crowd and you're going to get juice off of it. And it's going to be the turning point in the match. Well, we had the big crowd. We needed a turning point in the match. This is what I had planned ahead of time, but now he's got a broken arm. He can't do it. So Tom just pulled him out and post him like we did everybody else, but he gets fucking juice. And now the second set of heat has not only thrown the fans off because now they're like, Oh, wait a minute. We thought, the guy made the tag. We thought it was going to be over with, but also now he's pumping blood that everybody can see. This is this is fucking serious. And now shit starts to get, you can feel the vibe in the fucking crowd. Remember people started getting, Oh, wait a minute. And it's a little more serious. Now fucking bodies are all over Jericho. And I, I told Hildebrand, go in and start checking for a blood stoppage. And Jim Ross was brilliant on this call. The blood was everywhere. The heels are vicious. The referee's checking him. Jericho's selling like a fucking wet rag. And finally, Hildebrand stops the match. on Ring the bell. It can't continue. And actually, Hildebrand wasn't being... He wasn't being assertive enough because the heels kept trying to get in front of him. I wanted him. I was screaming at him, drag Jimmy Del Rey back and look at him better and blah, blah, blah. But anyway... The match is stopped. He's about to declare the bodies, the baby faces. And this one thing, Jericho, he started begging a little too, he was inexperienced, but he started begging a little too alertly after he'd just been a dish rag. He was supposed to crawl on his knees and weakly tug at the referee's fucking pant leg and look up and be shaking his head and just make the praying motion. But instead, he's all animated now, but he's still losing a lot of blood. But he's begging. And that way, Jim Ross can say, my God, the kid, he doesn't want to quit. He doesn't want to lose it this way. The kid's got a broken arm. He's losing blood, but still. And then, and of course, my crack production team from the Tennessee Production Center completely missed this shot. And it was a four camera shoot. They didn't have it on anything somehow. But while I'm bitching at the referee for restarting the match and Jimmy Del Rey gets uh, all over fucking Jericho again, me and Tom are bitching at the referee. Lance Storm hits a super kick on Jimmy Del Rey and knocks him over backwards over Jericho, who just grabs his leg and gets a quick one, two, three, and the place blows again. They didn't expect that. So how would you describe it, Brian? Like I said, it was a shitty match for being a smooth match. It was an incredible display clinic for a heel leading green baby faces and it was a spectacle at the end that ultimately got over just because of the level of violence involved. It was a good match building. And then because of the blood, it took a turn none of us expected. So we all thought there, at least I did, it was a great match because of the spectacle of it, because of the blood. There was so much blood. It was all over Brian Hildebrand. It was all over the ring. It was everywhere. <laughs> and, um, you know, we didn't realize yet in the crowd that he had, we, we noticed he had the cast, but we didn't even realize it was a cast. At least I didn't. Well, it, it, and, and it wasn't, it was a fake, it was a plastic cast. It wasn't plaster. It was one of those tape on restraints. Cause they wanted to put, he knew he couldn't work in plaster. He came back to work. He was going to, he was planning that night to work the rest of the week out. Cause Johnson city was the next night. 
And he had to go back to the hospital and have surgery after this fucking match. So he didn't get to do that. And then the next night in Knoxville, or next night in Johnson City, that we started the Heavenly Bodies against Lance Storm as a handicap match. And I've got that match on tape too. The bodies led Lance for the first 10 minutes. He kicked the shit out of both the bodies together and got over like a million dollars. And then they cut him off and started getting heat on him. And as he started selling, we ran Tracy out to jump up on the apron and milk for the tag. And that turned out to be a better match than this one was. Anyway. But again, you're looking at it with different <laughs> eyes because you were a part well, of it. You know yeah. what you intended for things to be. To the average person, it's a great match. Well, to the average person, the next one ain't going to be. And this is probably my biggest regret overall in Smoky Mountain Wrestling history. That I did this at this time. Uh, the next match was the Smoky Mountain Heavyweight title, the Dirty White Boy, Tony Anthony, defending against Terry Bam Bam Gordy. And have I ever even told you what the original plan for the Smoky Mountain title match at Night of Legends was going to be? Correct me if I'm wrong. I think the original plan was Dirty White Boy versus Jake the Snake Roberts with snakes around the ring. Yes. Not around the ring, in the ring. In the ring, excuse me. <laughs> Here was the deal. And once again, Stockholm Syndrome. I was getting a little too much WWF at that point. But <clears throat> I, had, I was desperate for a name money drawing heel, especially when the bodies left. They got their chance to go to New York. I needed somebody for Tony to work with for the title. And also I needed heels with heat and Jake, the snake Roberts at the time was working triple a, I remember he got that $25,000 payoff for shaving his head that night. He was so hot down there Yeah, and he was living in Marietta or Northern Atlanta, three hours, four hours away. And I went down and talked to him at his house shot promos he was clear-eyed clear-headed i'll treat i'll be fair with you if you'll be fair with me that whole type of thing so i brought him in and shot the angle on tv where he basically attacked the dirty white boy and then while white boy was either handcuffed or immobilized in some kind of way to the ropes he grabbed dirty white girl and everybody knew at that point it'd been so many years they were together that kim and, and white boy were a legitimate couple as well as, you know, she was his sometime wrestling valet. And Jake DDT's fucking Kim, the dirty white girl, right in front of Tony and makes him watch. We took it straight out of the John Wayne movies, right? And I wanted to see if we could get some heat on Jake. As certainly, everybody, nobody argued that he could work or he could promo. And the first time it was the double main event at the Volunteer Slam in Knoxville, Jake against the dirty white boy in their grudge match. But the second main event was Randy Savage versus Bruiser Bedlam. And we did, what was it? A couple thousand people. I don't have my books in front of me that may. So, I, okay. But then when June came and it was the rematch between fucking white boy and Jake and, and he was going to be everywhere in Johnson city and all that stuff. And that was the match that was kind of going to carry the load. Johnson City did okay, and of course that that night in June is when the OJ chase was going on. That's why I fucking OJ Simpson owes me five grand. So it was impossible to really tell whether it was taken off yet. And I figured, well, July will tell the tale. Well, July told two tales. Number one, Jake no showed, and I never saw him again for three fucking years. And I had to switch the belt in Bluefield, West Virginia, as they say. And secondly, he didn't fucking draw. The July gates were disappointing compared to what we'd done the previous year and et cetera. So that white boy was floundering, but at least I knew that we were wasting time with Jake and we'd go in another direction. So originally when I thought that Jake was going to work, I said the blow off will be that Jake challenges white boy at the night of legends. We're going to drop the cow folks. We're going to do everything we can possibly do to sell this place out. Thankfully it didn't need it. Uh, Get even with me for doing what I did to your fucking wife. Get even with me for stealing your belt. Get even with me only in my kind of match. And we were going to put plexiglass or some type of thing around the, the ring posts and have them wrestle in a ring filled with snakes. But we didn't. And they didn't. And I'm glad we didn't. However, 
<clears throat> what we did end up with was at the same time as Jake has gone AWOL, I hear, because Terry Gordy just lived down the road in, in Saudi Daisy, right outside of Chattanooga, Terry's back wrestling. Terry's back wrestling. Everybody knows. You can Google it. It had been a cut. He was on some of the first Smoky Mountain wrestling shows. And because he lived merely 100 miles from Knoxville, he would have been on a bunch of them. He would have been figured in from the word go once we got started, except he had the situation where he was going to Japan and took too many pills on the plane and went in a coma. And I get, how long had he been out? Was it a year and a half? Was it two years? It seemed a long time. It may have been just a year. I think it was 93 when it happened, and this is the summer of 94. Well, it seemed like a long time, but anyway. But we all heard, and, and you know, everybody knew Terry and who, at that point, so a lot of the guys were checking on him. I didn't want to disrespect the Smoky Mountain title by on a show this size having White Boy against Conan Chris Walker, who was going to be next in line if he had to stick around. Thank God a lot of these fucking people, now that I take another look at them, thank God they left me before I had to fire them. But I said, we got to get a name. And in Knoxville, there would be hardly any bigger name than Terry Gordy. And I said, I asked a couple of people, yeah, he's back working. He looks good. Okay, so we, we, I, once he got there that night, he's, he, there's no interview with him on the, on the tape. There's an interview with White Boy. There's no interview with Terry because he just couldn't get it. And in the in the ring, <clears throat> you know, it, now you'd look at it today and you'd go, well, this guy is better than almost everybody because his work was fine. It was basic and fine and solid, but it wasn't Terry Gordy anymore. There was no emotion. It was listless. It was plodding. There was not that fire. He didn't scream at the top of his lungs. He didn't get the eyes. He didn't have the facials. He didn't have the... The energy, he'd, if he'd just pick somebody up and drop them, not plant them like he used to. If he'd hit somebody, just hit them, not fucking knock them goofy. It wasn't Terry anymore. And he got some of it back by the following year when we brought him back. We brought him back as, as I mean, it was half because we wanted a, a name like that on the cards, but it was half because we all felt like we were doing something for Terry because what else was he going to do? That's all he wanted to do. It's all he knew how to do. And by 95, he could get he could get more of the match and in the ring back, but he never got the promos back. And in the locker room, if you, if you and I would be talking, he would walk up to us and he would stand there. And if neither one of us noticed him, he would stand there for 20 minutes until somebody stopped talking. He and then you and then you had to acknowledge him. Oh, Terry, Terry, you need something. And that, yeah, I was just wondering, you know, if uh, that's the way he always talked, but it was low and it wasn't, you know, it, it just part of Terry wasn't there anymore. So anyway, this match, there was nothing wrong with it. It wasn't embarrassing. Nobody did anything wrong. It just didn't have any life. And it was Tony doing basic things and calling basic things for Terry. And then that fucking idiot Conan Chris Walker runs in for the DQ and they get a little heat on Tony. He was supposed to start a program. It was He was horrible. He was green. I'm glad he left. But that's one regret I have. We used Terry before he was ready. Even I mean, the following year, it wasn't going to help anybody or hurt anybody. It was just, it was a good thing for Terry and, and, and you know, it wasn't going to help or hurt our show that much. But that year, we shouldn't have put him in that environment, now on that stage. <laughs> so I wasn't, but what did you, I mean, was that the first time you'd ever seen Terry Gordy live? That was, yes, actually, it was the first time I had seen Terry Gordy live. You're being very kind, and I understand why. That match was, to us, sitting there just all murmuring to each other, and yeah. I can tell you, to me, it was, it was bad, and it was, it was, well, it was depressing, I... and it went on way too long. And th yeah. Not that it went on for a long match, but. For what was happening, there was one point where he had White Boy down in the corner and he was giving him the boots. Yeah. And it was so depressing. And we had hope for a second because when he got to the ring, you played Freebird. And he came out to Freebird and he got in the ring and he started doing that Terry Gordy thing with the jacket on, the hood on, where he runs the ropes. And it's like, holy yeah. shit, it looks like Terry Gordy. And then the match started and quickly it 
it was it's maybe yeah. the saddest thing I've ever seen at a wrestling show, to be quite honest with you. Yeah. And well, and 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 that's it. When he he could the one the first thing he got back and the thing he got back best was hitting the ropes. I don't know, I don't know why, but the, it, you know, when I said everything was fine, it was a horrible match, but it wasn't like it wasn't like he exposed the business by picking people up and dropping them or doing he didn't look like a klutz. He it just looked like it looked like a 10 minute match being played on the video speed to where it goes 20 minutes. It just, yeah. there was no life. There was no nothing. There wasn't. And you know, whatever part of Terry's brain that was without oxygen or blood or whatever it was for a while, you know, sometimes those things don't regenerate and that's, and then, and he got the WWE spot in 96 as the executioner just because of who he had been and, and how people wanted to help him. And, uh, but, you know, then it, it, that's why that at that point they put the hood on him because, you know, you didn't want to say that was Terry Gordy on the WWF. But anyway, it was it was yeah. sad. It yeah, was, at one it point was, in 96, I got to see him in Philadelphia. Heyman brought him up for ECW and it worked because there was enough smoke and mirrors. Heyman was able to hide all of Terry's weaknesses with constant run-ins and Raven's flock and different things happening in different places. But, you know, yeah. that was the thing. I saw him in 94 and it was terribly depressing. 95, it still wasn't Terry Gordy, but you could tell that he had improved a lot. So you kept thinking, okay, this is 95, maybe 96 he gets a little better. I mean, you don't know how a brain injury works, but right. there was a little while there where I did think maybe he'll keep getting better. And unfortunately, that reached its limit too. Yeah. And anyway, so that was that. Uh, then on the DVD, we did a complete rivalry recap between Jim Cornette and Bullet Bob since August of 1992. And the reason why I did that was because <clears throat> with the legend ceremony and the card that I didn't want to cut, uh, they had said, Jim, we're going to have to do a two, two tape, two VHS set. Cause you could only get two hours per, per tape max at that point. Right. And I said, well, fuck, we got an extra hour to play with. Let's just do this. And we recapped. So if you watch the, the show, which is what I wanted to happen, if you watch the DVD or you bought the tape at the time, you understood the rivalry between me and Bullet Bob Armstrong that had been intended all along that for two and a half years I'd booked this to come to a point like this. We'd had our peaks and valleys and our confrontations. He put me in a hospital. I put him in a hospital. He put me in a hospital. Then I brought Terry Funk back to get even. Then they had a Texas death match that, that Bullet Bob won and blah, blah, blah. So this recap goes for a while and gives you a good look at Smoky Mountain's TV angles and some of the big show matches. It was the Fantastics and Heavenly Bodies in a Cage. It was the promo between me and Bullet Bob where I come out knocking Bullet. And I'll say, I'll tell you who's not only is all of the Smoky Mountain wrestling wrestlers and, and the fans ashamed of this idiot as commissioner, but even his own family is ashamed of him. I did the promo where I said Dixie Dynamite. I revealed that Dixie Dynamite was Scott Armstrong. With a sock I, on his head. Yeah, with a sock on his head. And he wears a mask <laughs> because he's ashamed of his father. And then Scott comes out and unmasks himself voluntarily and cuts that promo where he says, I didn't want to be favored as daddy's boy. I didn't want people. I didn't want to trade off my father's name. I, I hid my face, not because I, I'm ashamed of my father, but because I love my father. And then here comes Bullet Bob out, and he's fucking jerking his clip-on tie off. And he's like, you got something to say to me? Say it to me. And I fucking, we wear each other out verbally, and then I go too far, and he knocks me fucking goofy as he's turning to walk off just like Bill Watts. He's that boom. Instead of slapping me, he punched me in the head. Uh, then we showed the Rage in the Cage match where we put sent Bob to the hospital after we crucified him, handcuffed to the cage, and I cracked his sternum and hit him 18 million times with the racket. And then we show the clip where he gives me the two pile drivers who got juice on me and sent me to the hospital in Knoxville when Boss Man was the referee. And then where Terry Funk came into Knoxville and beat Bullet Bob with help from the branding iron and then the rematch, the Texas death match, the first time Terry did a fucking moonsault and he was supposed to miss bullet, but he didn't go far enough because he didn't know how far he could go. So he went ahead and pinned <laughs> bullet anyway. Good bullet rolled in and Terry landed on his back. <laughs> but I, 
<clears throat> he had never done a moonsault, so I didn't expect him to do a moonsault. I leaned in he and on a pile of chairs, right, that he'd thrown in the middle of the ring. I said, Terry, what are you doing? He said, I don't know, Corny. <laughs> And then, you know, the clip from where, and see it, Dory was coming in. Dory Funk was coming in for a lot of this stuff also. So he does run-ins on some of these things, including the match Bruiser Bedlam versus Randy Savage. I'm in Bruiser's corner. Tracy Smothers comes out to help Savage. And where else did you think about this? I, I'm seeing Randy Savage fucking trading right hands with Dory Funk Jr. And I'm thinking, is that the only place that would have ever happened? Can you think of another? Uh, huh, interesting. I mean, unless it was during his period as Randy Poffo in Georgia before he became Savage. Okay, so that ain't Randy Savage. Uh, no, actually, I guess well, not. Well, then I promoted the the only event ever where Randy Savage and Dory Funk Jr. kicked the shit out of each other. Um, And then uh, we did uh, showed the matches with Dory and Terry Funk with me against Scott and Steve with Bullet in the Corner. And then Tracy Smothers gets Bruiser Bedlam where Bullet and ba and uh, the Funks and everybody gets involved. And then here was here was one. There was an angle we did one time leading up. No, it wasn't one time. It was leading up to this fucking match. It was leading up to the Night of Legends. We had Tracy Smothers against Killer Kyle. And then we have a bench clearer where one after another, every heel and every baby face comes out and you're either fucking on the heel side or you're on the baby face side and everybody's fighting inside the ring, outside the ring. Bullet had gotten knocked down and got juice and he's bleeding. And finally he rolls out of the ring and waves it off and says, fuck it. And the announcer's like, my God, Bullet Bob's leaving. Where's he going in this chaos? He comes out, the ri- I had wanted him to make a big comeback, right? That everything went according to plan until this. But Bullet usually, if he made a big comeback, he used a baseball bat. And I said, boy, I really want you to wear these motherfuckers out. Just make your own comeback. But in the, we were in a school and in the locker room, <laughs> there was a black wiffle ball bat that you couldn't tell from six or seven feet away was not... It was plastic, but you couldn't tell. And we put some white tape around it like you would if it was being a bat being used in batting practice. I said, make the comeback with this and just lay waste to everybody, right? Which he did. <laughs> but then as he's in there bleeding and he's cutting his fired up promo and he, it's the last go home for the Night of Legends, <laughs> the bat bent. <laughs> <laughs> so as he's shaking it, you can see that the top foot bent just a bit. And it, it wasn't real obvious. If you weren't looking for it, you might not see it. But now that I've called attention to it, but I was like, oh, fuck. But <laughs> anyway, um, then I do a promo about the match. And then the Bullet and Tracy introduce the mystery partner who was Road Warrior Hawk. And we do promos from the teams. And basically, Bullet Bob Armstrong has resigned as commissioner. To get back in the ring, he's joined Tracy Smothers, the wild-eyed Southern boy who's our top baby face, and to defeat my evil minions of the Funk Brothers and Bruiser Bedlam, he has brought in the one guy that sent me to the hospital in my career, the fucking Road Warrior Hawk from the scaffold match. He's got Cornette's number, and it's going to be a Coward Waves the Flag match where the only way to win is to force your opponent to wave his white flag of surrender. I'm holding the flag for the Funks and Bruiser Bedlam. Guess who's holding the flag for Bullet Bob, Road Warrior Hawk, and Tracy Smothers? None other than the meanest, toughest, orneriest, most no good, dirty, stinking SOB that ever wrestled in East Tennessee, the number one hillbilly, the king of Kingsport, old brother Ron himself, Ron Wright. And Ron had been cutting a promo, said, I have i don't care if a man's leg is hanging off. I don't care if a man's head's busted open. I don't care if a man's bleeding and his bones are broken. I ain't going to wave that flag. And when he said it, everybody knew, well, we've seen fucking over the past 30 years, we've seen Ron Wright with his eyes swollen shut and blood coming out and scars and stitches on TV and all these pictures and things. He ain't going to goddamn wave this flag. And there's our main event. And it was old-fashioned Southern wrestling chaos from the start. They jump each other. I mean, the Funks ain't going to fucking stay in the ring very often. 
They jump started it. They fucking fought wild. Then finally we settle it down. We get some heat on Tracy. He's the only other guy that bled that night besides Jericho. And we got just enough juice to be able to halfway beat him to death. But Ron won't wave the flag. And then finally the tags made the comeback. It's a six way, whatever the fuck I go around and I'd seen this. This was done. Who the fuck did this first? The coward waves. The flag match comes from at least from Dick, the bruiser in my mind, because we saw those with uh, them and the legionnaires, Jacques Goulet and Don Fargo in, in the seventies in Indianapolis. But I think the first person to do this finish may have been in Tennessee somewhere, maybe at the other end of Memphis. But anyway, I go over, throw powder in Ron Wright's eyes so he's blind and grab his flag while he's staggered away to clear his eyes. I get down below the ring apron and stick the flag up, and I'm waving the flag in the babyface's corner. So if the referee turns around and sees it, then he will immediately call for the bell. All the fans know this, but the referee hadn't turned around and seen it yet. But Ron gets his eyes clear. And Ron then snatches me and oh shit. And I shit myself and he punches me and I go down still holding that fucking flag. And I'm still in the baby face's corner. And as I get up to my feet, here comes Ron right to fucking murder me. And I take the flag and I swing it at him <laughs> and he backs up and I swing again and I'm fending Ron off with this flag. And the referee turns around and sees me waving the fucking flag and my guys lose. <laughs> And the people once again go fucking crazy. And then we wanted some way to go off with a bang, right? And I don't remember whose idea this was, but I, I went along with it if it wasn't mine. I should have known because it involved me having to be fucking nimble on my feet. But the idea was that Ron would then roll me into the ring and all of my heels who had bailed out on the floor on the other side would come in to try to help me. And Hawk would pick me up by the neck and give me the hangman and then fucking drop me to the baby faces. Right? Well, when Hawk grabs me, he starts picking me up and without giving me a chance to jump. Cause I guess he thought he could do it, but he underestimated the weight of my bliffed ass. So he got me halfway up there for a while and then threw me down, but they grabbed me as the heels are coming in they're going to shoot me off. And as they shoot me toward the fucking heels, I'm supposed to jump and kind of cross body all the heels. They'll catch me and everybody will fall down. Well, fuck from where the heels were to where I started. I had like fucking nine feet head start to begin with to running, start, jump and leap. Right. So I kind of cross bodied bruiser. A little of my head hit Terry. And I think Dory kind of picked my legs up off the ground, <laughs> but that was, it was not exactly a death defying fucking bump. Uh, but I take the bump into the heels and we all roll out. And then the people fucking screamed and yelled and cheered because everybody was happy because the baby faces won. So it doesn't need to be a good match because the baby faces won. That's what you pay to see. And then unfortunately on the video, I did a glory days video to the Springsteen glory days, but it's dubbed over on the DVD and, because uh, they get so shitty about commercial music these days. But that was the Coward Waves the Flag match. That was, And that also may have been, when you think about it, that's the only time that Road Warrior Hawk would have ever been involved in a match with Ron Wright. Yeah, I mean, I might have been going to bother guessing at that. There's not a single <laughs> place they would have been before that. Unless but, Doug now, Ward put them both on a show after the fact. Well, really. after the fact. But, um, it, it, I mean, and once again, that's what I used to like about Japanese wrestling. When you'd get the, the tapes and you'd see matches that could never take place in this country, like Nick Bockwinkle versus Ricky Steamboat or whatever, because they were in different territories. And it's, But uh, it, we brought everybody together for the big night of legends. What was that? That was the first time. Was that the first time you had seen the Funk Brothers live? That was the first time I had seen the Funk Brothers live. Yes. What did you think there? Well, Terry. I mean, I was a massive Terry Funk fan. He was already one of my favorites. He was just at another level at this period of time. He was doing that great stuff in ECW at the same time. He's doing that great stuff at Smoky Mountain. He's appearing on WCW TV. Great promos. I remember the promo we did on TV. I may have been the week before 
Knoxville, or it may have been the day of, because we may have seen it in the hotel in Knoxville, where he's like, Bob, Brad, Bill, all the illegitimate Armstrong kids, <laughs> running down the list of all the illegitimate Armstrongs. Seeing him was great. You know, Dory didn't, you know, Dory is Dory. Dory was good, but seeing him was great. It was still a big deal to see Road Warrior Hawk live. Yeah. You know, there was yeah. still a little bit of the aura around the Road Warriors at that period of time. And the thing with Dory is also he he has suffered by comparison because w- with modern audiences, when you compare, when you stand Dory beside Terry, it's like, you know, which one are you going to watch? You're going to watch the quiet guy or you're going to watch the guy with the chainsaw, you know, over his head and fucking screaming at the top of his lungs. But it for historical purposes, you know, when you think it to be able to say you've seen the Funk Brothers live in person as a tag team. Um, that was a big deal for me. When, the first time I actually got to see the Funks live together was in 1981 when they both came into Memphis. And the match was Jerry Lawler and Jack Briscoe versus Dory Funk Jr. and Terry Funk. I actually just found the programs, uh, one from Evansville and one, you know, they were the same programs with the yeah. inserts from that period of time. Yeah, 81. And see, that's the way it, it, Dory in this kind of match didn't fit. The way you, you needed to see Dory in his natural habitat was against Jack Briscoe. Because they, that was the first time I'd seen Dory Funk Jr. live, and I get to see him against Jack Briscoe, which is, blows my mind anyway. But that was the gold standard. In 1972, Dory Funk Jr. and Jack Briscoe was the same thing that 1989 Ric Flair and Ricky Steamboat was, and the same, I, you know, a modern day equivalent. I've I've said one time Tyler Black and Davy Richards in Ring of Honor in what 2000. 10 that year was was like a modern day equivalent of that but for historical purposes door and and the thing is <laughs> marty came up to me one time she always take pictures when the boys her boys would come up i had booked the funk brothers in tag team matches against the armstrong brothers and they enjoyed them and they had fun and you know and here's not only the armstrongs are thrilled to be working with the the funks that, you know, their father had, was a contemporary of and that they have so much respect for, but also they brought such good stuff out in Scott and Steve as a babyface brother tag team having to fight against these fucking heels. But Marty shows me shots of they've got holes and they're doing moves and there's drop kick. And then she says, here's what my boys do when they go to ECW. And there's Terry wrapped up in barbed wire covered in blood from head to toe while Dory's trying to cut him out with wire cutters. And she said... I don't know about them, but I sure enjoy our trips to Knoxville more, you know, but it, anyway, but therein you have 25 years later. So basically for everybody that thinks that I just think that everything old is great and that everything new sucks. No, I've put some stuff that's new over, over the past couple of weeks. And I've also just illustrated a few things that sucked. And by the way, great American bash 89. The Dynamic Dudes versus the Skyscrapers. That match still hurts my fucking feelings. It never should have even taken place. Good God. That was the worst fucking 80s match I've ever seen from a major company. So, yes, I do knock old shit. Yeah, where did that come from? <laughs> because I just watched the 89 Bash for that Fighting Spirit magazine column, and I, that match still the stench of it I can't get off of me. That like, was the worst match. I like that match better than the Brian Pillman-Bill Irwin match just because of the spectacle of the fans reacting to Sid. Well, it was a spectacle, all right, but as a matter of fact, they fell into a glass grinding machine and made a spectacle of themselves. All right, anyway, folks, that's a supersized edition of the Jim Cornette experience to make up for anything that we didn't give you last week, and I don't know what we're doing next week because that's still two weeks from now. So my tongue has fallen across my eye teeth and I can't see what I'm saying, so I will close for now. Brian, do you have anything else left to say? So we're back on the drive through this Monday. I think so. Okay, then I think I'll be there. Well, I think we'll do it. If we don't, we'll drop back and punt. <laughs> okay. Until then, uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of my, on behalf of myself and the group. Uh, thank you. Fuck you. Bye-bye, everybody.